What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If Afa Martial Arts Master Transmigrated Into Tai Lung. Part 2. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Tai Lung's POV hopefully, that's the end of it. I feel a lot better than I did before, and I was relieved to finally come to terms with whatever issue was between us. I was really not good with these emotional things. I'd rather punch some evil villain or train until my bones cracked. In the end, I had already come to terms with everything, and I have accepted myself when I attained inner peace. What happened was simply a manifestation of my emotions. Hopefully, Shifu find his inner peace too. I did not know if he achieved such a thing in the movies but I could help him this time around. I left the past out Shifa lying near the pond in the Jade Palace, as I made my way outside. The palace was mostly destroyed and absolutely wrecked, with a giant crater in the middle. That would take some time to fix, but it can definitely be restored, so I was not worried. I went out of the Jade Palace and stood at the top of the steps as I stretched my body. There really was no place like home as I felt my soul at peace. I looked at the horizon, and my eyes took in the magnificence of the clear sky. The dark clouds had dispersed and the storm had retreated, as if to represent the end of the emotional turmoil I was in not too long ago. I stayed like that, enjoying the first rays of the rising sun, until my peace was disturbed by the sound of rough breathing. I opened my eyes and looked down at the steps, and I could see a panda crawling up the stairs. He was already halfway the thousand steps but he still had a long way to go. I couldn't help but crack a smile as I watched him face his greatest adversary in his words, stares. It was amusing, to say the least. Ha, huaya he he breathes heavily, and his needy gasp sounds like a fish trying to breathe in a desert. Huaya huaya ha, and now he was choking on air. I never knew it was possible to choke on air, so points to the panda for teaching me something new. Hey, panda, I called out. And he turned his head up as his exhausted eyes looked at me lazily. Seriously? How do you get your eyes tired from climbing up steps? Ah, why? He suddenly realized who I was, and he nearly lost his footing and fell back down to the beginning of the stairs. Luckily, he managed to catch himself. You don't have to hurry, I will wait for you. I said as a giant smile split my face. I gave him a thumbs up which he returned. Okay, thank you sir, he yelled back, waving his hands at me before he flopped down on the steps like a dead meat. I thought for sure that he'd be much better, and would even be able to climb the stairs properly, considering he had more time to train, but it seemed stairs were his kryptonite, something which he could never overcome. You can do it, Dragon Warrior. I cheered and laughed while I watched Poe slowly drag himself up the final steps. At last, he was able to bring his body to the top of the stairs, and he immediately laid down, exhausted and with his tongue rolling out. He panted like a dog for a while until eventually, he stood up. So, you must be Poe. I have heard a lot about you. I said while taking a few steps toward him. Yes, I am, Poe said before he paused. Wait, you've heard about me. Where? I mean, all good things I hope. No. He said the last part unsure and insecure. It was truly amusing seeing him like this. And it made me realize just how much of a character development he went through during the three movies. Who'd have thought that this panda would become one of the most powerful kung fu masters that ever lived, rivaling the likes of Ugwe himself? It was equally amusing and frustrating. Enough about that. I think you have something I want, I said as my eyes narrowed at him. My carefree attitude disappeared in an instant, and my face morphed into something cold and serious. Oh, right. Po said, and he took something from the back of his pants. It was the dragon scroll, in all its glory. I decided to not question where he hid that. You want it? Come and wah! He screamed as I moved with lightning speed and punched him, sending his body flying like a ragdoll, while I stole the scroll from his hand. Boing his body flew away and fell on the stairs. His body started bouncing like a ball as he fell down, crashing one at a time on the stairs. Did I feel a sick sense of amusement when I saw him fall down on all the steps he climbed so hard? Maybe. Did I also revel in seeing all of his effort going to waste as he found himself at the bottom of the stairs? Just like how all my efforts to be the dragon warrior went to waste. I won't speak until I meet my lawyer. Ah uh, ah uh, ah uh, ha 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 I watched as Poe fell down the stairs comically, until he stopped in the market at the end of the stairs. I looked at the dragon scroll in my hand, and although I knew it was blank, it held an important place in my life. So I decided to keep it. Besides that, no one else in the world other than us knew it was blank, so it could be useful to distract an enemy or use it to trade for something more precious someday. But for now, let's keep those thoughts away cause I have more important things of interest. What the fuck was that? I asked myself and looked at the hand with which I punched Poe. I knew how to punch. 
I knew it so well that it was like breathing to me at this point. So I knew my punch landed on the panda. Yet I also knew my punch did not hit him. It was strange. It reminded me of my childhood when I used to hit a certain dummy made of rubber. As I grew, I made it a tradition to destroy a dummy or training material in a way they were meant to be used. It was a show that I have mastered the thing I was training. For example, if it was wooden dummy made to train kicks, I would destroy it with a powerful kick. And if it was a ball of iron to train my claws, I would cut it with my claws. Yet that dummy was the only thing I could not destroy. Shifu used to joke that Uguay made it to train his very first student after he invented Kung Fu. Yet even after a thousand years, it had never required a repair once. Now how is that related to Poe's body? Why did it remind me of that dummy? There must be some interesting thing about him that makes him tick. He was supposed to be one of the strongest after all. There must be a reason besides just plot armor. Well, let's find out. I thought with an evil smile as I felt my obsession with Kung Fu begging me to learn everything. I threw the dragon scroll at the roof of the Jade Palace, before I cracked my neck, and put a huge amount of strength into my legs. Boom with a loud explosion of force that devastated the ground where I stood before, I shot into the sky. I did a flip to control the trajectory I was falling and aimed right at the market where Poe was standing. I used my limbs to guide me when I started free falling to the ground. The air rushed past my fur as I enjoyed the feeling of freedom right before landing on the ground. E-H-E-W-W-W boom. I did a superhero landing as a controlled shock with welcome me. I stood up and nodded in satisfaction when I saw the admiration on Poe's face. Where you? Awesome. He said, almost fanboying before he collected himself. So, Dragon Warrior, let us fight to decide the fate of the valley. If I win, I will destroy all and everything you love. I said to him and I saw his face get serious. Good. And what if you lose? He asked me and I looked at him like an idiot. There are no such thing. Do you accept? I won't let you destroy the valley, Tai Lung. No matter how cool you are, I will protect my home as the Dragon Warrior. He said and got into his famous stance. Good. I said and a savage grin spread my face as I raised my fist. Our battle will be legendary Tai Lung's POV. Our battle was not legendary. He yelled Dash wo you. Boing. Thumb. Po would charge at me time and time again. But I simply blocked every attack he threw at me before I launch him to the sky, flying away, again and again. Okay, tough guy, how about you eat this Poe yell before charging at me? I sidestepped away as his punch missed, and he was leaning too much on the punch that he lost balance. I grabbed his body and took control of his weight, spinning around I threw him into the air to fall onto the place where he started. Boing thumb I mean, I did not know what exactly I was expecting, but this was just not it. But then again, he had only been training for less than four weeks. In fact, he could be said to be only slightly below a member of the Furious Five. An impressive feat given he only trained for few weeks. But that was worthless power to me, since I could take all five of them with ease. I should have expected this. I was so much stronger than him. The only way he defeated me in the movie was because instead of fighting him, I was more focused on the scroll. The funny thing was how good he was when it came to fighting for the scroll. The whole training arc he had was related to him and Shifa fighting over food or one dumpling. And in Maya battle, the whole theme was the two of us fighting to obtain the scroll. If you think about it, was it not too convenient that his whole training was related to fighting over something, as if he had known we were going to fight for the scroll beforehand? A coincidence? I think not. It was the universe's will bullshits. You cannot defeat me, Dragon Warrior. You do not have the power to back up your title. I said and kicked him on his jaw, sending him flying away again. Boing thumb in his defense, he was quick to recover as he quickly got back to his feet and moved around quickly. Or at least that's what he must have thought. But in reality, he was only moving his head around quickly. I wanted to tell him, just because it looks like you are moving fast from your perspective doesn't mean you are actually fast like Shifu. But I didn't cause he looks stupid. It's funny. He lunged at me. Boing. Thumb. Maybe the dragon warrior at the end of the third movie would be a worthy opponent. Poe with inner peace could also be a great opponent to fight against. But the one standing in front of me, he was too young and inexperienced for me. Let's end this. I said with a growl before I shot towards him. I threw a punch aiming for his head so that I could knock him out. But by pure coincidence, he dodged it. Or was it a coincidence? I thought so because of his comical reactions to his own movements. I threw different attacks at him and surprisingly, he did well to dodge them. But he still evaded my attacks with a woe wee, as if it was by a fluke that he dodged my attacks. Interesting. I thought to myself, don't tell me the universe favors him so much that it allows him to dodge multiple attacks by pure coincidence. That'd be too op. It was frustrating. I didn't know if he was doing it intentionally. But it was a great way to agitate your opponent and invite them for a reckless move. Then you can take advantage of their opening with a counter-attack. I continued attacking him while he blocked and evaded. But after a few seconds, I decided to increase the intensity. Let's do 40% of my strength. I balled my hand into a fist and stand in a linear stance. My attack started from my feet, gathering kinetic energy until I unleashed everything in a one-inch punch. My punch landed on him, but similar to last time, 
I didn't hit him. I watched rapt attention as the force of my punch slowly traveled up his fat body like a wave, dispersing the damage until it was reduced to nothing. Or not. Under my shocked eyes, the waves of kinetic energy returned slowly and traveled up his arm until Poe's body snapped back at me. I put my arms up and blocked the incoming double punch. But I was still sent flying and crashing into a building. Whoa, crash. Wasn't that an interesting little thing? I said with a smile as I walked out of the destroyed building. I think I figured it out now. His body was special. You would think that his fat body was not suited for fighting at all. But you would be wrong. Instead, it was perfect. If this was a Chinese cultivation novel, it would state that Poe had the heavenly rubbery physique or a mortal saint soul balloon body or something. I thought it was strange that he had no specific style of fighting. Many would consider having no specific kung fu to be a great weakness, but that was not the case for Poe. Instead it was strength. Every kung fu style has a weakness, and there are two ways to remove that weakness. You either learn every kung fu technique to cover that weakness like me, or you decide to not have a specific kung fu altogether like him. We were opposites. Now it became ironically ingenious. Was he full of weakness without a kung fu? Well, some might say having everything as your weakness means you have no weakness at all. I used my knowledge of the Kung Fu Panda movies and even other fiction and martial arts knowledge to analyze him seriously. His whole gimmick seemed to be fluidity, the freedom to come up with the best move on the fly. And then there was also the interesting thing about him which was his body. That's when the fact that he reminded me of the dummy I used to hit in my childhood finally made sense. Poe was also just like that. The harder you hit, the harder it hit back. It was like he was mirroring the power you were using when fighting him. That would go on and on until you went all out, and then when he fights back, matching your intensity, you will lose eventually. You truly are one of a kind. I said pulling him out of his happy moment. He was looking at his own hands as if he did not believe what he just did. Oh really? Then come at me. He said and got into a stance, a wide smile on his face. I lowered my body and started running at him on all fours. I was going to get a little more serious and see if he could really match my power. A roar thundered out from my throat on instinct, and this time, Ho looked extremely serious as he blasted himself at me. In a clash of strength, we locked our forearms, and a shockwave cleared our battlefield of sound and pebbles. Then the fight began as my arms became a blur of motion that unleashed relentless attack at the Dragon Warrior. Po seemed to have an innate talent for dodging as he weaved through my attacks to launch an attack of his own. He threw a punch and I grabbed his fist before pulling him towards me and landing a hock at his abdomen. A wave of kinetic energy rippled on his body again, as I found myself ducking under a punch that was too strong for him to throw. He did it again, his body had the natural ability to contain the kinetic energy, and release it in his attack. It was incredible dot they never go into detail about how things work in the movies, or explain their kung fu, but there are interesting things to learn in this world. We started exchanging blows as the fight got more intense. Each of our attacks seemed to grow stronger and more lethal as the fight went on. Snake style, the muscle in my arms relaxed to the extreme, until it suddenly burst into motion, becoming a blur as they attacked Poe like a snake going for a lethal bite. Black Tiger Fist, my footwork became a blur, and the solid ground acted like waves for me, as I float from one place to another. My punches also became like waves as they curved around Poe's defense, and hit him wherever I wanted. Charge of Master Sloth, my attacks became a combination as each attack set up for the next. They were stitched together moves that get stronger and stronger the longer it goes uninterrupted. A combination of attacks ends at 4-6 to six moves but this technique could go on for three days if not disturbed. The weakness was obvious, disrupting one attack reset the combination to zero. But it was the first time Poe was seeing it, so he could never hope to disrupt the combination. I used this kung fu to see the similarity between it, and how Poe seemed to be able to mirror the intensity of his opponent's power. Just like that, the fight went on for a while, as I used different kung fu on the dragon warrior, testing his strength and finding out his potential. I lowered my body and delivered a powerful back kick to his jaw. That sent him flying into the sky. Although I love playing with him, it's time to end this. I leapt into the air and when I reached him, I executed the perfect hammer kick and sent him flying down to the ground. He crashed on the ground with an explosion of shockwaves that caused an earthquake. His bed made a deep crater. How much force can his body take? I thought to myself as I fell from the sky and descend directly on Poe. Let's see, 50% I thought, and while holding back half my strength, I slammed a punch at Poe's body. Boom, an explosion as if a bomb had detonated, shook the whole market, and the ground made webs of cracks. A huge crater was revealed when the dust settled with Poe lying in the center. I stood beside Poe as I watched him grunt in pain. But I'll Ultimately, he could still stand up on his feet. His body was not durable or hard like Tigris, but his ability to take hits and recover was insane. If Tigris had a high defense, Poe had a high HP and HP recovery rate. I guess that is to be expected of the Dragon Warrior. I think he healed quite easily even after he was shot point blank with the Cannon of Shen. It took him three days to heal from his near-death injuries. Yu Ha Yu, Tai Lung, I will not let you. He said as he staggered up to his feet. After a few more seconds, he lunged at me with whatever strength he had left. I already learned that his body was resistant to blunt attacks like Luffy. But what about sharp attacks? I thought before stepping back to dodge his punch. Then I let out the claws on my right hand and stabbed it at the side of Poe's abdomen. A part I knew had no vital organs. 
He instantly stopped as he remained unmoving. My claw sank into his body to draw blood. It must have been the first time he saw his own blood because he seemed shocked. Strange, I thought you'd pop like a balloon. I said with a smile when he looked up at me with wide round eyes. I pulled out my claws and pushed him away as he staggered back. He fell on his back, and when he looked at the blood pouring from the wound, he started panicking. No, no, I don't want to die. He said in a dramatic manner as he started sobbing. But without any real tears. Stop the drama. You wouldn't die from just that, it's only around two inches deep. I said with his fat body. That was but a scratch. Really? He asked relieved. Yeah. Just make sure to put pressure so you don't bleed to death. I said and Poe was quick to put pressure on his wound. Then he looked at me with betrayed eyes. The Furious Five should return soon. I said as my ear twitched, listening to them running towards us and the villagers who were just behind. Just tell them you fought bravely and earned my respect. So I no longer bear hatred towards you as the Dragon Warrior or the Jade Palace. I said turning around and running up the stairs again. I was done for the day. I need a good rest after my long journey. I made a beeline to the student barracks of the Jade Palace. I was home. I was at peace. I need not fear attackers, and it was nice to sleep on a proper bed after so long. So when I reached the room, I instantly fell asleep and slept for the whole day. Third POV The Furious Five Poe and Master Shifu were currently gathered in the pond of the Jade Palace. The once awe-inspiring Hall of Wonder and Majesty was nowhere to be found replaced with a wrecked hall and a devastated floor. That hints at the intensity of the fight that took place. It was a broken palace. Master Shifu was standing at the edge of the pond while turning his back on his student. His eyes were focused on his own reflection in the water as he was deep in thought. The students of Shifu had just finished helping the villagers settle back into their homes, and they reassured them that they were safe with the lie that the dragon warrior had protected them. It took a long time to calm the villagers, but at last, when it was evening they were done. After that, they had all gathered at the Jade Palace and found their master like this. Master, what are we going to do? Viper asked with a hiss of worry. Um, correction, what can we do? Monkey said while folding his arm as they all looked at their master for answers. We can always run away. Mantis commented as everyone else snapped their neck to look at him. Or not, he added. Let's all calm down first and wait for Crane to come back with the news, Tigress said to her fellow students. And just as she finished, the sound of flapping wings brought their attention to the entrance. Crane flew inside with rapid breaths and a panicked look on his face. He tumbled on the floor as he could not even execute proper lading due to his panic. It's true, he is sleeping in the student barracks at this very moment Crane declared, getting the gasp of everyone's in response. Tai Lung of all people was sleeping in their room. What the heck were they supposed to do about that? Whose room was he using? Monkey was quick to ask the important question as everyone looked at Crane for answers. I don't know. What do you expect me to do? Get closer to the dorm and see whose room he was sleeping in. Hell no. I am not going anywhere near that guy. I love my life thank you very much. Crane defended his ignorance. The only thing I know is that he was indeed sleeping in one of the rooms. I think you might be overreacting a bit Crane. Mantis said after he appeared on top of his hat in a blur of speed. Easy for you to say. You were not pushed down and threatened. You were lucky to get taken out early. Crane said. I still remembered it clearly. The dangerous eyes he had when he pushed me against the ground. And told me he wouldn't show mercy next time. His body shivered just remembering it. It seemed after his encounter with Tai Lung. Crane, ever soft-hearted, had developed PSTD. He was under the most emotional torture after all, seeing all his friends taken out, not knowing if they were alive or not. Yet he was not able to do a damn thing. And then he was taken down from the sky which he always thought was a safe place for him. The threat Tai Lung gave him was the final nail in the coffin. His eyes Crane muttered and remembered Tai Lung's bright yellow eyes burning with cruelty and violence. It feels like he was looking at me like food. Crane said, many people had looked down on him before, and even had eyes of disdain for him. Yet none could even come close to how uncomfortable he felt under Tai Lung's gaze. The eyes of a predator looking at his prey. He definitely wanted to eat me. Don't be ridiculous. Tigress scoffed, why would anyone want to eat you? She said, feeling a bit defensive of Tai Lung. Tai Lung isn't like that. I I guess. Crane said, although to this day he wondered why Tai Lung muttered would it be like chicken, right before letting him go. After that small exchange, everyone turned back to Master Shifu who was still deep in thought, looking at the pond. Master Shifu finally turned around and looked at his students. He observed them one by one, and noticed that Poe had a bandage wrapped around the side of his abdomen. Other than that, everyone else was fine. You all did a good job in helping the villagers. You are dismissed for the day, Shifu said stoically to his students who were taken aback. But master, what are we going to do about Dash you'll do nothing? Shifu cut them off. The Jade Palace is as much of a home for Tai Lung as it is for all of you. If he wants to stay in the Jade Palace, he can stay. It is his home. Shifu said with no room for argument, but Viper found one. But Tai Lung is a villain. He is a criminal. We can't let him stay here and endanger the valley. Viper voiced out her rejection to the idea. Viper, Tai Lung is not who you think he is. He is not what the rumors made him out to be. Tigress said. She was going to say good, but she realized that Tai Lung may not be evil. But he was not good either, like he said. He was also annoying. 
He hurts Poe Viper snapped at Tigress, anger apparent when she said that. Everyone turned to the panda who was awfully silent as he stood with them. He made a face when he realized everyone was looking at him, and he wiggled around nervously. Um, he started, he seems cool. Although he hurt me, it was during the fight, and it is not that serious. Although Poe was afraid of Tai Lung at first due to all the bad rumors and stories about him, he was surprisingly chill. He might be rude and ruthless, but Poe definitely felt that he was not a bad person. Everyone nodded, agreeing with his words as Poe was running around with them, and helping the villagers even with his so-called injury. But he is still a criminal and a fugitive, what about what he did to Milan City? He killed Master Wu Bao this time. It was Crane who spoke out? He seemed to side with Viper, he though Tai Lung should not be allowed to remain in the Jade Palace. He explained that to me when I asked. It was not an attack but a duel to the death which both of them accepted. The reason was related to Wu Bao's father whom Tai Lung defeated, or something. And Wu Bao wanted revenge. Tai Lung never attacked the city itself. Tigress came to Tai Lung's defense yet again. And you simply believe that? Viper asked, why are you defending him anyway? What did he do to you while you were with him? It was truly surprising that Tigress was defending Tai Lung. She used to be the one who hated him the most yet here she was, taking his side. Tigress glared at Viper for her stupid question. She just came to learn that Tai Lung was not evil like the people made him out to be. It was not fair, so she wanted to make it right. There was nothing more to it, she was simply doing what she thought was right? Uh, I see. That makes sense. Shifu said, catching their attention. I do recall about the fight Tai Lung and Li Xu had. It was the source of gossip around China for a while. Shifu touched his beard while recalling that event. Li Xu's great reputation was ruined after Tai Lung defeated him with one finger, and his dignity was also destroyed as he peed himself during the fight in front of thousands of crowds. It was such a dishonor to his name because he was a serious and respected giant bear. The fact that he peed himself was especially humiliating for a person of his stature. He never recovered from that humiliation and killed himself a long time ago. Such a tragedy that was. But Tai Lung could not be blamed because he only mastered the nerve attacks during that fight. So it was not on purpose that Tai Lung humiliated Lishu like that, but from Wu Bao's perspective yes. It seems reasonable that Wu Bao, the son of Lishu, would seek revenge against Tai Lung. Shifu said with a sigh, Suo does that mean Tai Lung is living with us now? Mantis asks, yes. It means just that Mantis. Shifu said, and no one else had other objection. In the end, Shifu was the master of the Jade Palace. They had no right or audacity to question him further. And even if I were to decide against it, there is nothing we can do. Shifu said in a measured tone, who was going to drive Tai Lung away if he wanted to stay here? The different masters in China who refused to come to their aid when Tai Lung went on a rampage. That should speak volumes of how respected and feared Tai Lung was. It was the duty and honor of every Kung Fu master to give aid to the sacred place of Kung Fu, the home of the inventor of Kung Fu when it faced danger. Yet they would rather abandon their honor than face Tai Lung's rage. However, there was one possibility, if a kingdom decided to get rid of Tai Lung, and used all of their troops and masters to attack Tai Lung. But what kind of kingdom or city would waste such resources for a single person? None. So it could be said that Tai Lung was unstoppable, especially after the passing of Ugwe. There was nothing that could be done. The Furious Five also realized this. What were they going to do? Fight him again. They did not want to do that ever again. But worry not students. I have talked to Tai Lung and settled the issue. He will not hurt any one of you if left unprovoked. You can return to your rooms now. Shifu said, and with reluctance and helplessness, the Furious Five and Po left the Jade Palace. Shifu watched as his students left with a small smile. Then he turned back to the pond which had now settled while they talked. The water was calm, and Shifu could see his reflection clearly. A failed father. That's what he saw. But the universe had given him a chance to redeem himself. Tai Lung was going to live in the Jade Palace from now on. Maybe, just maybe, he could do better this time. Master, Tigress called and brought Shifu out of his reverie, as he turned to look at her student. May I sleep in the guest room? Shifu raised his eyebrow. Tai Lung's POV you know you slept well when you slept in the morning and woke up the next morning. A full 24-4 hours of sleep. When I first woke up, I thought I had only slept a few minutes instead of a whole day. But the subconscious part of my mind told me that it had been a day. But I still did not get up. I continued closing my eyes as I enjoyed the afterglow of the great sleep. My soul needed that. It wasn't until my ears picked up the sound of footsteps coming inside the barracks that I opened my eyes. I pushed myself up on the bed and stretched my body, which seemed to be full of vigor more than ever. The room was neat and without any decoration or items that held personality. If not for the pleasant scent of the room, I would call this room mundane. Yet as I took in the smell, I couldn't say I did not like the room. The sound of footsteps stopped in front of the door and paused for a second, before it was slid ajar to reveal Tigris. Oh, it's the kitty, good morning. I said as Tigris looked at me with a cold face, the face of stoicism. You slept in my room, did I? I asked. I thought it was a free room since it was so mundane. Her stoic face broke as she glared at me. It was a lie, we both knew I could tell if a room was used or not just from the smell. But where else was I supposed to sleep? Crane used a mat as a bed since he slept while standing up. 
Moki used a hammock that could de-not support my weight, Mantis was too small, and Viper used a log to coil around and sleep. The empty rooms had no beds. There was Poe's room which I could have used, but between Poe and Tigress, I chose her because we were both felines, and the type of bed we wanted to sleep in was similar. I am here to wake you up and invite you to breakfast, she said and my ears perked up at the word. Breakfast. Food. Count me in. Lead the way. I stood up from the end and followed her as she led me towards the dining place of the barrack. The barracks of the students consisted of three buildings interconnected to make one house. The barracks could hold around ten people, and it had a kitchen, dining room, living room, bathroom and everything in between that you could hope for in a house. In fact, the barracks were rather luxurious and big when compared to houses that existed during this era. It was a show of just how influential and wealthy the Jade Palace was. We went to a different section of the house, and I looked around at the changes that had taken place while I was away. Be quiet, he'll be here soon. I just don't get it. Why are we going to share a meal with him? What if he decides to stop playing nice all of a sudden? It is Master's order. Remember, he told us to be nice and to treat him like one of us. Technically he is our senior so we should be respectful. Who the fuck would disrespect him anyways? What I am worried about is if he would mind me standing on the table. Po, are the noodles ready? Just a sec. I am going to serve Tai Lung. I'm kinda nervous, so don't rush me. I heard the lively chattering at the dining table as we went near it, but the moment Tigris and I stepped in, an absolute silence descended in the room. I stood at the entrance while Tigris went in and took her seat. I watched my juniors in amusement as they wiggled awkwardly in their seat. I slowly brought my hands up and imitated a monster's call before I said boo. Funnily enough, Crane and Monkey still flinched in their seat rather loudly. Really? How badly did I traumatize these kids? Chuckling softly to myself. I took the empty seat which appears to be reserved for me. The Furious Five eyed themselves and me while I got comfortable in my seat. Good morning kids. I said while eyeing everyone on the table. My tone was cold and firm, a contrast to the amusement I felt when I looked at them. Morning. Good morning. They wished me back politely, but I could see that they were unsure of how to act around me. It reminded me of the time I was a young student and shared a meal with Master Flying Rhino. I was too unnerved by his mere presence that I couldn't even eat properly as the food went stale. To share a meal with someone you knew could break you anytime they want to be in the presence of a superior beast. That feeling was especially intense for kung fu practitioners who dedicated their life to getting stronger. Especially if they were a stranger or a possible enemy. I remember being so frustrated and leaving as quickly as possible. Before making a beeline to the training hall where I trained for the whole day and night. Without even a wink of sleep. Master Flying Rhino came in the morning and told me he was impressed by my fighting spirit. He even taught me a few of his techniques, and we separated on a good note. However, I think I was not on his good side anymore ever since I beat his son Master Thundering Rhino, right after his accomplishment of slaying 10,000 serpents in the Valley of Woe. I couldn't help it, the dude got lost in his own fame, and claimed that he was strongest of his generation. I had to go to the Guangdong province and show him otherwise. In fact, I think he might even be hostile to me since I killed Vacha, the commander of Anvil of Heaven when I escaped my prison. He was one of Master Flying Rhino's favorite students. As I got lost in my thoughts, Po had already set up the table and put our meals in front of everyone. The Furious Five waited for me to first eat my food as they stared. I shook away my thoughts and took a look at the bowl of noodles in front of me. I smelled it and observed it carefully, while the nervous Po took a seat beside me. Then under the eyes of everyone, I started digging in. Seeing that, the Furious Five also started eating their food. It was good that they were treating me respectfully like a senior. I made quick work of the most delicious bowl of noodles I had ever had in my life, and after that, I slapped Poe on the back. I am glad I did not kill you. That was the most pleasant bowl of noodles I've ever had. I said seriously, and he gave me a smile which quickly turned unsure when he fully comprehended my sentence. Um, dot dot thank you. He said, unsure if it was right to thank me for not taking his life. In the end, he shrugged, seconds. Most definitely. Poe got up with my bowl and returned with more noodles. I nodded in satisfaction when he put it in front of me. Maybe being a vegan is not so bad. I thought to myself and my eyes wanted to crane. He visibly freaked out when we locked eyes, what's wrong with him? Poe sat back to his seat in a rather noisy manner due to his weight, and then he tried to make a conversation. He was the most talkative among them and he was uncomfortable with the silence. So, you never had noodles like this in prison? He asked with no intention of offense in his tone, but the others looked at him with wide eyes. Was it okay to bring up something like that to Tai Lung? They thought. Honestly, I did not care. Forget about noodles. I never got any food while I was imprisoned. I said which took Poe back by surprise. He was someone who loved and needed food. He could never imagine being without food. What? But I thought you were in prison for a long time. 20 years. I said as I swallowed the noodles. In 20 years I never got food. Or water. That seemed to surprise even the Furious Five, as they gave me a questioning look. But how did you survive for that long without food? Poe asked the main question as everyone listened to hear my answer. I did not want to give a long explanation about how I wasted minimal energy in my immobile state, 
Or how can I help me? Instead, a small playful smile appeared on my face as I turned to the panda. I feed on my hatred and wrath to survive for all those years. I said with all the seriousness in my voice. Where we post said in awe, is that why you are so nice now? You ate all your hatred and wrath. I held back a laugh, exactly. I went back to eating my foot as Poe took in the information, until it clicked that what I said didn't make too much sense. Wait, how did you dash? He was joking Poe. Wiper told him. Ew, the others chuckled seeing the gullible panda, and the mood became a little less awkward. So, Dragon Warrior, tell me about yourself and how you became the Dragon Warrior out of all these masters. I asked initiating a conversation. I wanted to make them all comfortable with my presence even with all that had happened. Since I was going to live with them, there should not be any conflict between us. And technically, they were my juniors, so it was my responsibility to guide them and help them when they needed. Well, it all started when I was an egg, and then I was born to my father. Po started retelling his stories from the very beginning. Tai Lung's POV, shall I repeat myself? To Mr. Chen, owner of a tavern near the outskirts of Mongolia. It is located in the village of Rice, the closest village to Chorgon Prison. Tell him it's from Tai Lung. I said for the final time to the messenger duck. Yes, I will do as you say. The duck said he also happened to be the same one I caught during my prison escape. After that, he took off from the training ground to deliver the money thrice the amount I owed, and a proper letter of apology. I went into thought as I watched the messenger disappear into the horizon. It would be a lie to say I regret my actions. But I knew I was wrong for the way I behaved on my way to home. Until I finally got the closure of home I didn't know I needed. I was quite violent and aggressive in what I did. Almost like a child who was upset but did not want to throw a proper tantrum. So he resorted to being very petty and intense. I guess being in prison for 20 years messed me up in some ways that I did not even realize. There was no need for violence in that tavern. I could just escape, and no one would be able to catch up on me. It might be due to the battle I had with the Anvil of Heaven previously that I was so hot-blooded and so quick to initiate violence. Nevertheless, no one died, and I hope the money was enough to compensate for the broken tables. I was not sorry for the warriors who fought me though. It would be disrespectful to them as warriors if I apologize for beating them up after they stood up so bravely for justice. I have also sent a letter to the rulers of Milan City, which explains that the fight that occurred was a duel initiated by their so-called protector. Although he was a great warrior, he was a very bad guardian, blinded by the need for vengeance. And about the restaurant, I was not going to apologize like I did to Mr. Chen, because they were the ones who denied me entry. In this world and era, it was the ultimate show of disrespect if a restaurant denied you food even when you had the money to eat there. They were establishments that promised to feed the people, food was the basic necessity to life. That was universal. And to deny that even if they were criminals was viewed as disrespect. Whoever you are or whatever you do, you have the right to be able to buy food and eat for sustenance. The restaurant probably thought since they were popular and had guerrilla guards, they could deny me entry. It was also why they were so polite about it. Like how people say no offense, and proceed to say the most offensive shit ever. I was not going to take that level of disrespect. I turned around and left the training ground. I went to the training hall instead, and when I entered, I was greeted with the familiar training equipment and obstacles. There were some changes to new equipment and an obstacle course. But the overall layout and the design were still the same. The hall was quite noisy and full of life, as the Furious Five were currently in the middle of training. My eyes wandered around, carefully observing the hall until it fell on Shifu who was watching everything from the side. I walked towards him and stood beside him. We observed the ongoing training for a while until I decided to break the silence between us. Good morning Shifu, I said. Good morning son, he said while nodding and taking a brief glance at me. That single sentence threw me for a loop as I was caught completely off guard. But in the end, my heart felt at ease being called that. It's kind of unfair how I could he could make me feel such emotions with just a single word. Father, I said in this time, it was Shifu who was caught off guard as he lost balance. He looked up at me, flabbergasted, but I remained stoic. It filled me with an odd sense of satisfaction seeing him just as affected if not more than I was. He coughed a few times to dispel his shock before he said, I was aware of what you did. That was truly admirable. I scoffed. It was nothing, it was the natural thing to do. I made a mistake, it is impossible to not make mistake as long as we live and breathe. But we should always be able to accept our mistake and take responsibility for it. Schiffer looked at me with a raised eyebrow. That is indeed true. But I thought with your ego and strength, you wouldn't admit you can make a mistake. I know I am not perfect. I said with a laugh, it's my ability to learn from my mistakes and face them that truly sets me apart. Schiffer joined me in my laughter. You've changed, he said. I shook my head, I've grown. I looked at him and he was giving me a proud smile. I was taken aback remembering the times when I would do literally anything to earn that smile. We shared a short moment together before we returned to watching the ongoing training. It was quite a sight even for me. The way they moved and the skills they possessed were indeed something worthy of being admired. Tell me what you think of them. Shifu said, you fought them so you should know. Fight is a strong word. I said with a knowing smile, they are decent. Decent, huh? Shifu said thoughtfully while rubbing his beard. That's a high praise coming from you. I guess I must be doing a good job then. He smiled. Well, don't be too sure. I said they were decent. I said and Shifu turned to me with questioning eyes. 
What do you mean? I point at Viper, she is too nice. I point at Mantis, he's subpar and predictable. I point at Crane, fragile and too smart for his own good, overthinking during fights. I point at Monkey, nothing noteworthy. But most importantly, I pointed at Tigress, she's the worst, completely unacceptable. Tigress with her neen senses heard my words, and she turned to me only to be hit with a log during her distriation. Like I said, it's unacceptable. They are decent when they fight together, but individually they are all below the standard. I said, the Furious Five were like parts of a powerful machine. Together, they were strong enough to even defeat the likes of Wu Bao, but alone, they were completely useless. I see. Well, they have been fighting together as a team since the beginning, so it would make sense if their kung fu developed to strengthen the team, instead of their personal strength. Shifu said thoughtfully, I will let them work on their individual fighting power. He said, maybe giving them solo missions will help. He went silent as he thought more about the idea. And anything you want to say about Tigress in specific? Shifu asked. Well, she is definitely the strongest amongst this generation Furious 5. But with her talent and potential, she could be so much more. I said, you really think so? I know so. I nodded. It's just that she had not even found her true kung fu. And she is stuck between imitating me and trying to control her ferocity. Shifu coughed three times. That might be my fault. For the majority of her life, I was trying to teach her to control her strength and fight with precise technique even though it was obvious she was more suited for hardcore style. After that realization, I pushed her to use your leopard style kung fu, since you both have similar builds. So you have been trying to turn her into something she is not. Shifu sighed. Yes, I was ignorant. It was only recently that I learned I did not need to turn them into something else. Instead, I should teach them to be themselves. I don't have to turn you into me. I have to turn you, into you the line Poe quoted in the third movie, rang in my mind. I was treating them like I did you, desperately trying to turn them into something they were not. Shifu admitted, I was a genius and even if I was able to learn every kung fu in the world, yet even I could never be something I was not. Silence descended on us again, as the grunts and screams of the Furious Five filled the silence. Would you mind giving them a few pointers as their senior? It would be beneficial for them to learn from a different master and get another perspective. Shifu offered. Are you sure? I asked. You know me, I am not gentle when it comes to training. By all means, go all out. I smiled before a question popped in my mind, where's the dragon warrior? Oh, he works as a waiter in his father's noodle shop, so he won't be able to train until evening comes. Shifu said, I did not know if I should cry or laugh at that information. Let's just stay neutral, okay? I said and stepped forward before I clapped my hands loudly, causing the training to stop as everyone looked at me. Juniors, I announced, it's your lucky day. Today, we learn real kung fu. Tai Lung's POV the Furious Five were lying on the ground, bruised and completely toasted. They had never experienced the training as intense as what they just experienced. It was not because they trained harder or longer than usual, but simply because their health and their very lives were on the line. Although it was true that Shifu was a stern and strict teacher, he was only words and orders. I on the other hand was extremely rough with them in a physical sense. They trained a lot, and they practiced their kung fu techniques again and again, refining them to the limit. But training at the comfort of safety and no consequences of failure, could only get you so far. Ultimately, your body and your mind will realize that there is no risk, so you will not push yourself hard, stopping slightly below your limit, when you should aim to surpass it. It was different today though, as I challenged them all to fight me together in the middle of the obstacle course. The key word being fight and not spar. They knew I would not hesitate to take their lives or even hurt them, so it pushed them to their limits. They had to fight in a way that they had never thought of in order to survive. They made breakthroughs. It was during a life and death situation that we animals truly evolve and surpass our limits. If the level of your skills was not tested in real combat, they would never grow. So I gave them that opportunity. Of course, I was not actually going to kill them or injure them seriously. I was skilled enough to give them that delusion, while also making sure nothing dangerous ever happened. I used my reputation and negative impression they had of me to affirm that lie, and they all believed it. They thought I was just doing this to get revenge and was aiming to kill them. In their eyes, they barely escaped with their life due to luck. They thought I had all the intention of making an accident and killing them. It would not work after they get to know me better. But for now and hopefully for three or more times, they would continue bellowing and grow under the pressure of a life and death. Color me impressed. Everyone survived and with no serious injuries. Sadly, I whispered the last word loud enough that they barely heard it. They gulped. You can rest for some time and eat your lunch. After that, you will do strength training. I said as the Furious Five released a sigh of relief. They stayed lying on the ground as I left them, and made my way back to Shifu. That was truly a remarkable session. Shifu said as I stood beside him and we watched the exhausted Furious Five. You seem unfazed. Are you tired? I scoffed. It did not require much to school a bunch of kids. Shifu remained silent as he stared at me with his signature raised eyebrow. You've gotten even stronger, Shifu said, but there was an underlying question in his tone. How did I get so strong while I was imprisoned? If anything, I should have gotten weaker. I did not answer his question as we both remained silent, content with enjoying each other's company. I was never someone to talk a lot, and Shifu was still a little conscious of me, 
So he was still not comfortable with acting like that to me. Then suddenly, the door of the training hall was slammed open, and the dragon warrior ran in. He was breathing heavily, but there was an aura of pure excitement oozing from him. I'm finally here guys I am ready for training. He exclaimed loudly. But his jolly attitude stopped when he saw his friends laying half dead on the floor of the obstacle course. Guys, what happened? I smiled looking at him before walking up to him. Dragon warrior, follow me. What are we going to do? Are you going to teach me one of the techniques from the thousand scrolls of kung fu? Are we learning how to fly in the air? Would I be able to break giant boulders like you after this? Wait don't tell me. You are going to teach me your secret move. The dragon warrior said excitedly with eyes shining with enthusiasm and hope. Dragon warrior. I said in a serious tone as Poe lose all his giddiness and gulped. I knew calling him the dragon warrior instead of Poe was making him uncomfortable, which in turn made him more responsive and act responsible. So I always called him that. Did you know of the hidden meaning behind the dragon scroll? I asked and I saw his eyes gain an unexpected shine of rare wisdom. Yeah, he said, there is no secret ingredient. You don't need to add something special to make something special. You just have to believe it is great. That means the change in canon did not affect his character growth by much. He learned his lesson and that's all that matters. He can keep believing that phrase. You are correct. He was not. He was the dragon warrior and had all the secret ingredients. He had the special body, was the chosen one of the universe, had a whole ass prophecy about him defeating Shen, and was coincidentally a panda who was species extremely attuned with Kai, a great power in this universe. That was what made him special. Not simply because he believes himself to be. Even I had a secret ingredient, which was the fact that I recalled my past life. No secret ingredient my ass, he was full of secret ingredients. The scroll was just something that hid the secret ingredient. After all, it wouldn't be a secret ingredient if it was not a secret. You can't convince me that it was all a coincidence. I have no special moves or techniques for you. I said, the only thing I can do is advise you to start going on missions and gain experience. He was different from the Furious Five. He had great talent and a unique body that helps in fighting. The best thing I could do was offer an advice to get more experience. No specific kung fu or technique suited him. And, I did not possess the same incredible body like he did to guide him. I tried to be the Dragon Warrior, and I failed. It'd be weird if I tried to tell the real Dragon Warrior how to be one. You shall join us in the strength training, I said, and Po pushed his fist on his hand and bowed to me. Thank you Master Tai Lung. He said, I have always been a fan of all your achievements even though you went evil for a while. So I am happy to get your advice. Hum. He sure knows how to flatter people. His honest tone and his eyes that belied no deceit was proof that whatever he said, he believed. I coughed a few times on second thought maybe I should teach you a secret technique. A technique I had tried many times on my way home, but couldn't succeed in, because I did not possess a huge Kai reserve like the Dragon Warrior. We will need an actual field expedition for this. We should go search for a mountain bandit. I said and looked at the sun. We still have time. The Furious Five could continue their strength training without me. Master Shifu, their true master was with them. Follow me. I said as the dragon warrior came up to me and walked right behind. So, Master Tai Lung. He said as he switched from my right side to the left. What super awesome technique are you teaching me? He asked in a curious voice that was dying to get an answer. Ever heard of the Waxy Finger Hold? I asked back and his jaw dropped. He froze like a statue while I continued walking with a smile smoke on my face. He quickly shook his head and followed me with a bright smile and shining eyes. No way the next day it was finally time to do one of the main reasons why I came back to the Jade Palace, and decided to make it my home. To learn the knowledge and wisdom held within the library of the Jade Palace. Specifically all the knowledge related to Kai. It was not only to study but to practice and conduct research as well. I walked through the Sacred Hall of Warriors, which was in the middle of repair as I thought of the different possibilities of Kai. I figured my knowledge from another world would be extremely useful. Although that world had no Kai, I remembered practicing it and learning about the basis and theory of Kai during my training in mastering every Kung Fu. Not only that, there were many fiction which at this point, I was sure were real that dealt with the power of Kai or other related abilities. I could use that knowledge and try to apply it in this world. Who knows, I might even be able to replicate fictional powers. Hopefully, my time reading those cultivation novels also come to use. As I was in thought, I had already reached the library, and I pushed the door open to gaze at the rows of shelves on the wall, and the thousands of scrolls contained in them. The reason why I did not immediately visit the library was that I wanted to settle everything else before focusing into my studies. I couldn't have any other distractions. Let's begin. I said with a smile and closed the great doors of the library. When he opened the doors again, he hoped he would come out wiser and with a new breakthrough. Tai Lung's POV for the next month. I stayed cooped up in the library of the Jade Palace, breezing through the countless scrolls that held knowledge of this world. Unfortunately, there was not much information on Mastering Kai as I hoped there would be. Maybe it was done on purpose by Ugwe to prevent such power from getting into the wrong hands. Or maybe it was too rare to be documented. I did not know. Out of the countless scrolls, only around 10 of them mentioned the use of Kai to affect the outside world. But even then, they dealt with the teachings of how to use Kai to heal others or give life to dead plants. There was not a single scroll that dealt with Kai, and how it could be used for combat. Which made sense as I would have definitely learned 
ended in the past if there were. Although that might be the case, my time spent in the library was very beneficial. Even the scrolls or kung fu theory which I had studied in the past after getting memories of my past life gave me a new perspective, and I could comprehend it in a different way. I also got to learn new informations which I had deemed useless in the past, specifically about the species which had been thought to have gone extinct hundreds of years ago. Humans. Igwe talked about the human species in one of his scrolls that note down every species in this world. There, it was mentioned that humans were furless and fragile animals that were born inferior to other animals in almost every way. It also talks about how the humans were considered extremely ugly by the people and often taken as slaves. They made for good workers and slaves because they could work small jobs for a long time. They had huge endurance when it came to physical activity that was not so intense. It was because they could produce sweat and their furless body made it, so that they rarely went overheat and could work for longer hours. The people living in Mongolia used to run a big human slavery trade, but as of now, humans were considered extinct. I did not know how to react at first, since I used to be the same species in my past life, but I was not as affected as I hoped I would be. I also got to read the other scrolls which Ugwe had written while I was imprisoned, and I have to say, although I may hate him for what he did to me, I also respected him greatly. His wisdom and knowledge knew no bounds. He was also the creator of Kung Fu, something I had come to fall in love with, so it was hard to not respect him. I also went out frequently to train the Furious Five and to do some exercise during the one month I studied. My relationship with the others was slow going, but at least now, I was seen as a fellow resident of the Jade Palace and not simply a villain that was staying here. I had taken my role as their elder and senior seriously, guiding them and teaching them with my limited knowledge. With all the wisdom I quoted from my past life, I think their negative feeling towards me was slowly turning into respect. Today marked the end of my study session as I walked out of the library and closed the door. I had not gotten the enlightenment I hoped for, but I came out wiser. I was a warrior and I never liked these scholar type things. So I think I did a good job focusing only on reading for a whole month. I went out of the Hall of Warriors and climbed down the steps as I made my way towards the Peach Tree of Heavenly Wisdom. When I reached the Peach Tree, I stood at the edge of the cliff and enjoyed the scenery of the Valley of Peace. It was beautiful. I could understand why Ugwe had decided to make this place his permanent home. The beautiful landscape of China had a mystical feeling to it. There was the bright sun on the horizon that lit up the sky clear blue. The clouds spread out like waves in the sky, while some came down low enough to hide the peak of the mountains. There were tall mountains the size of skyscrapers and rocky mountains, with green algae covering them. A mighty waterfall shaped the land as its rhythmic crashing made for a melodious sound. The song of nature. I took in a deep breath and took in the world around me. Then I went under the shade of the peach tree and sat with crossed legs, and I started meditating. I closed my eyes and tuned off the rest of the world, and only focused on my life force or in this case, Kai. The world lost all its identity as a new perspective of the universe opened up to me. A universe where everything was made up of energy called Kai, in a piece. It was a concept taught by Ugwood himself. It was a state of absolute peace between the mind and the spirit. How someone achieves inner peace is different from person to person, but it mostly involved the acceptance of oneself. Be it your past, your regret, your mistake, your flaw, or your identity. When you accepted all of these, when you accept yourself, you attain inner peace. Although it sounds simple, it was very hard to achieve, and Kung Fu masters spent their whole life trying to attain inner peace with most of them failing. After all, how can someone truly accept themselves? If a person was given the chance to change anything about themselves, would they reject it, and chose to stay exactly as they are? Be it talent, looks, physical attributes, upbringing, past mistakes, etc. Everyone wanted to change, it was only a chosen few who could sit there and say I am content with being myself. Be it my past, how I grow up, who I am, I accept all. It was because of this that masters who are of old age attain inner peace. When you are old, you are not as ambitious. You don't desire a lot of things. You feel like you have lived your life and there is not much you can do anymore. Hence it's easy to accept yourself. A young soul on the other hand, would always want to be stronger, richer, want to be loved, desire a different upbringing, regret their life decisions etc. This holds them back from achieving inner peace. In this harmonious state where the spirit and the mind are at peace, you are able to harness the flow of the universe. You do this by becoming one with the world. In this world only sentient beings have the trouble of accepting themselves. A tree accepts that it is a tree, and so does a rock, the mountain, the sky and the clouds. A tree had never wanted to change. A rock never wished it was a mountain. So when you finally attain inner peace, you become like the world itself. If you can't accept yourself, how can the world accept you? Therefore in the state of inner peace which was self-acceptance, you are accepted as a natural part of the world. Your Kai started seeping out of your body to interact with the outside world, and becoming one with the world. 
By doing this, you are unconsciously using your Kai to make miracles happen around you. That was how inner peace works and the power it gives. Otherwise, it made no sense how Poe was able to catch cannonballs fired at him. He was no master of technique to be able to redirect the force of the cannon, and it made no sense how the cannons did not lose their energy after being stopped. He was using his Kai to make miracles. As you become one with the world, by accepting yourself, your Kai seeps out of your body. You can then use your Kai to a small margin and influence the world. Not by much though as the world you can influence is limited to something close to you. I used it once to slow down time from my perspective, Poe used it to stop and redirect cannonballs, and Ugwe was said to heighten his senses to the point he could hear the flaps of a butterfly wings. Like I said, create small miracles. As you become one with the world, you can change it and control it as if it was your body. All this was done with the universal energy called Kai. That is what it meant to harness the flow of the universe. To harness Kai was to harness the flow of the universe. You, I breathe out as I felt my Kai seep out of my body to interact with the world. It was the first time I had truly meditated like this, and I made an important discovery in this instant. Of course, when everyone else obeyed the rules of the universe, I had to be different. I just had to be troublesome and come out unique. I have two Kai. Damn it. What does this even mean? Hours later I have two different Kai inside of me. The other one was mine, it was white in color. And I have had this Kai from the very moment I learned to infuse Kai into my attacks. But the other one was new. It was blue in color, and it stayed in on the deeper part of my body and spirit. I focus more as I look deep inside myself. My Kai had two layers, the outer layer was made up of white familiar Kai, but deep inside, under my white Kai was a blue Kai. I kind of had an idea why I had two Kai, but it did not make sense. It would be more logical if I had a bigger Kai, or if my original Kai changed. So why did I have two types of Kai? I let out a sigh as I knew I was not getting answers from anyone. I was probably the only one to have this issue and I would have to find out the answers by myself. Hopefully, it was nothing bad. My thought was cut short as I felt a sudden contact on my back. I instantly perked up and turned to see Tigress sitting behind me and resting her back on mine. I was so focused that I became unaware of the outside world. I wouldn't be able to do this anywhere else but home. This was one of the reasons I decided to live in the Valley of Peace. What are you doing? I asked to which she just proceeded to get comfortable leaning against me. I was here to call you for dinner. She said and I looked at the sky. The sun was beginning to set, and evening had come. And... I trailed off as I questioned about what she was doing. I don't know. She said and closed her eyes before melting on my back. It feels good to be around you. I was taken aback and became slightly flustered. I quickly shook my head as I realized the reason why she was comfortable around me. It was due to my Kai which was leaking out around me. Nothing more. Kai was the universal energy of the world, so it must have felt rejuvenating just to be around me. My Kai was affecting her body, filling her with energy and lessening her exhaustion from training. I let myself go and stopped being in my inner peace state as I leaned against her as well. Maybe it won't hurt to rest like this until my Kai slowly returned to my body. The Kai which was outside my body, slowly went back into my body as I rest, not meditating or focusing. A simple rest. Pa, that was not me. Tigress was purringing softly as she leaned on my back. She seemed to be enjoying herself. I looked back at her and at the small content smile on her face. Out of every student of the Jade Palace, my relationship with Tigress was the best followed closely by Poe. Maybe it was due to the days we spent traveling, or maybe it was because I was personally teaching her Kung Fu, since we had similar strength and build. But I have come to care for her a little, like a younger sister I never had. I entered in a piece in my Kai which was returning in my body, stopped its flow and leaked out again. It won't hurt to let her enjoy this a little. She had trained hard this past month, so she deserves rest. Third POV, why do I have to train so hard father? A small snow leopard cub once asked Shifu. They were in the middle of training, and although the cub listened to every instruction he was given and would repeat the same actions Shifu did as many times as he was instructed to do so, there was something missing. There was no purpose in his eyes, no meaning to his movements. It was like a play to him or a chore. It was something he had to do since his father wanted him to do it, nothing more. Shifu realizes this. The cub had endless talent and potential, he was a diamond, a one in a million. But talent can only get you so far. You need ambition, a reason to go beyond the mortal limit, a reason to persist. Shifu looked at the young cub who was nearly his height, though he might be young. He couldn't help the wide smile that came naturally to his face. You are destined for greatness, Tai Lam. Shifu said and patted the cub's head who leaned into his touch, always eager for affection. To attain your destiny, you will need strength. Shifu told him as the young cub listened to his words as if they were the words of a god. You will be the dragon warrior. It is your destiny. Shifu said, looking at the cub's believing eyes. That is why I named you Tai Lung. Tai Lung means great dragon. Shifu firmly believed that Tai Lung was going to be the dragon warrior, because Master Ugwe had told him once that he was going to train the Dragon Warrior someday. It was why he had become a master in the Jade Palace, and why he began taking on students. 
The Dragon Warrior was going to be a genius, a warrior unlike the world had ever seen before. And in Shifu's mind, Tai Lung fit that criteria. Shifu looked at the child's eyes full of life, and firmly believed that his son was destined for greatness. If he were truly meant to train the Dragon Warrior as Master Ugwe had said, then it would be Tai Lung. His son and the genius like nothing he had ever seen before. Really father? You promise? Yes my little Tai Lung. Shifu said and poked his nose, and don't call me father while training. Call me master. Tai Lung nodded with a happy smile and began his training again. This time, his moves and technique were exactly the same. But Shifu saw the great change. Now his movements were not mere consequences of an order. They held meaning. They had a purpose. Again Shifu said with a smile as he began teaching the future dragon warrior. The snow leopard Tai Lung was all grown up as he destroyed every obstacle course in the training hall. He had gone beyond Shifu's expectation, and with every new achievement, he was sure that Tai Lung was truly the warrior of prophecy, the dragon warrior, his son, and his greatest student. Shifu was the proudest animal in all of China, in the world. That is why I do all of this to be honest. Shifu heard Tai Lung's voice as he was broken out of his reverie. He looked at his son who was smiling at him, while standing at the center of the broken obstacle course. The training hall could no longer bear the might of Tai Lung and his kung fu. Pardon. Shifu asked with a raised eyebrow. Father. Tai Lung smiled. I said your proud smile is why I have always gone beyond, and why I pushed myself so hard. You rarely smile. Tai Lung looked a little embarrassed by what he was saying, but it was honest all the same. I am glad when I can make you smile. Shifu smiled again when his son said that. But you will notice his smile was a tad bit prouder than the previous ones. I told you not to call me father while training. Right. But a peach cannot defeat Tai Lung. Shifu screamed at his master. He was unable to comprehend how Uwe was telling him that the panda could be the dragon warrior. What did he see in that panda? He is just a panda, he is not a warrior, has never even trained in kung fu. And how can he protect anyone when he can't even take care of himself properly? He is just a panda and will always be a panda in Shifu's eyes. But maybe it can Ugwat said wisely while looking at Shifu's eyes. Two orbs of infinite wisdom meet confused ones. If you are willing to guide it, to nurture it, to bellow in it. Ugwe told him as Shifu's heart shook. You just have to bellow Shifu. Ugwe said right before his body turned into pink petals and he left the mortal world. Shifu took his words to heart and went to the panda. From then on, respecting his master's final words he started believing. He trained the panda to become the dragon warrior. And no matter how he himself did not believe it, no matter how much the panda disappointed him, he never gives up. He believed in Poe. In the end, he realizes that he was wrong. Poe was indeed more than just a panda. Poe was the dragon warrior. You gave up on me. Tai Lung said as he loomed over Shifu's small body. You did not believe in me. Tai Lung said, Shifu had stopped believing in his son. What father gives up on his son? Shifu had no excuse. He believed in the panda and he never gave up on him. Yet he could not do the same for the cub he called his son. Shifu opened his eyes as he stared at the ceiling of his room. The first ray of sunlight had woken him up from his slumber. Was that a dream? Was it a nightmare? Or maybe the truth? Shifu pushed himself up from his bed and started his day. He was the master of his student. He had to teach by example, so he could not stay in bed. On second thought, maybe he can. Today was the first day after Tai Lung ended his study session, so he had told Shifu that he would take over morning training, to teach his junior some things. Tai Lung's presence had changed a lot around here, not only for himself but for his students as well. The Furious Five were getting stronger than ever under the example of Tai Lung. His mere presence seemed to be a wall for them, something which they tried to climb over again and again, and in the process, it made them stronger. The frequent sparring and teaching pushed them to be stronger as well. In specific, Tigris and Po were improving by leaps and bounds. Tai Lung had taken a liking to the young tigress, as he had been teaching her kung fu, and given her special trainings. It was nice to see them get along as adopted siblings. Shifu could never wipe away his smile when he saw Tai Lung teach tigress like a brother teaching his younger sister. Tigress also seemed to hold Tai Lung in high regard, which was only natural, as he is possibly the strongest kung fu master in all of China. Po, on the other hand, held a great amount of admiration for Tai Lung. He sees him as a rival, and someone he must be equal to, if he wants to wear the title of the Dragon Warrior with pride. Po also seemed to be getting taught by Tai Lung, but in a different way. They would go out together to hunt for bandits, which was also Po's duty as the Dragon Warrior. And when they returned, Po would always learn a thing or two. Shifu had nearly lost his mind when Po returned with the ability to use the Woxy Finger Hold. It was believed to be only a legend or folk story, since no one had been able to master it, but the panda came home excitedly, and said Tai Lung taught him the move apparently. What a headache that one was. Shifu had to properly educate him on the dangers of the move, and made him promise to only use it as the last triumph card. Tai Lung's presence also changed Shifu, as he tried his best to reconnect with his son. It was slow going, but it could be said that they were in a good relationship. The childish and jolly bond was gone, in its place was the respect they held towards each other. Recognizing that both of them were mortals and they made mistakes, but they have grown. Speaking of which, Shifu realized that today was the day Tai Lung said he would help him with achieving inner peace. Shifu did not know how, but his son had achieved the legendary inner peace while he was in prison. How Tai Lung was able to achieve such a thing after what he did to him and how everyone wronged him was a mystery. 
Though right after the initial shock, Shifu's heart almost burst with pride as he looked at his son. Right, got a hurry to the training ground. Shifu said after he had freshened up and he made a beeline to the training ground of the Jade Palace. When he reached there, he was greeted with the sight of the Furious Five fighting amongst each other, while Tai Lung watched from the side with his ever-present frown. It was one of the worst traits he got from him. Tai Lung always had a permanent frown or scowl, just like Shifu. Although Shifu would have loved a smile more than a frown on his son's face, he also felt it was funny how he took that from him. Like father like son, I suppose. Shifu thought to himself. Tai Lung looked at him as he got closer, and with a small smile, he greeted him. Good morning. Good morning son. Shifu greeted back. Ready for your training. We're doing it right now. Shifu asked. Yes, we will do it now. And then you can mediate and try to achieve inner peace for the rest of the day. Tai Lung affirmed. I, I am not sure that's how it works. You are speaking as if I would learn inner peace overnight. You will. Tai Lung said, you are close and with my help, it won't be long until you can achieve peace of the spirit and mind. Really? Shifu asks, he had spent half of his life trying to attain inner peace, so he doubted it would be that easy. Yes, it's a simple concept. Tai Lung said, besides, you're old. Of course, no offense. Shifu's eyes twitched some taken. But look who's talking. You are not a young lad yourself. Tai Lung laughed at his comment, well thanks to Ugwe, my body is barely in its 20s. I haven't even reached my prime yet. Now that was an incredible statement, both because of Tai Lung's ability to thank Ugwe for something and realize that there is always good even in something bad, and that his son, possibly the most powerful warrior in China, was still not in his physical prime. That means he would even be stronger than he was now. Tai Lung had grown so much during the time he had not seen him. It hurts him as a father and master that his son slash student had grown in character this much, when he was not there to witness it. Tai Lung still had the darkness that Ugwe saw in him, that much was obvious to Shifu, when looking at all the things his son had done after prison, what he did while coming home, what he did to the mountain bandits, etc. But at the same time, Shifu also saw something which he was too blind to see in the past. The heart to change. Tai Lung was a bad guy trying to be good. That simple fact alone had made him better than the majority of people in this world. Shifu's only regret was that he never saw this side of him in the past. Maybe if he could travel 20 years back in time, he would go meet his son and say you are not born evil. You might have taken the wrong path, but you can always right your wrong. Everyone makes mistakes, but as long as you learn from it, then it's okay. I will help you. I believe that you have it in your heart to be good, son. No matter what Ugwe Seal says. You are my son, I know you. So stop your rampage and come home. But there was no such thing as a rewind button. You cannot change the past or take back your actions. Or in this case an action. So, shall we go someplace quiet? Tai Lung asked, bringing him out of his thoughts. Yes, let's do that. Achieving inner peace was simple, not easy. After the teaching was done and Tai Lung had told him everything he knew about inner peace, Shifu's problem became obvious. His regret, he needs to forgive himself and learn to accept himself in order to attain inner peace. Which really translates into it's impossible. In Shifu's head, he could never forgive himself. Tai Lung had told him that he forgave him, and said that he understands Shifu's position and action at the time. His son also said that he himself was equally to blame. But Shifu digressed. It was his fault. As a father, his son's fault was also his fault. As a master, his student's action was also his fault. Whatever Tai Lung was to deserve being imprisoned or to be called evil, Shifu made it. He made that Tai Lung. So as long as the vivid image of an innocent cup he loved and let down remained in his mind. Shifu will never be able to forgive himself. But who cares? Who needs inner peace anyway? I am happy just the way things are. He said to himself pretending to meditate when in reality, he was looking down on Tai Lung teaching Po and the Furious Five. He did not need inner peace to move forward from here. He believes that whatever happens in the future they will overcome it together. He had faith. Huh. Shifu said out loud as he looked at his body that was slowly leaking out his green kai. Finally, after years of training, Shifu had attained inner peace. And to think that it was this simple. He just needed faith. Tai Lung's BOV. I like to believe that I am someone who learns from his mistakes. A person who can reflect on his past actions to act better in the future. Every day, I am better than I was yesterday. Every day. I work in hopes that I will be even better tomorrow. So you can imagine, how much it bothers me that a random bear in Milan City, someone who was not even mentioned in the movies, was able to overwhelm me even if it was briefly. It has been on my mind ever since that day. It made me question my own strength and the faith I had in myself as the strongest. Of course, I could make a bunch of excuses like Wubo's strength that overwhelms me comes at the cost of his life, he became a mindless beast. So even if he overwhelmed me, I was never in danger or the fact that I was not exactly in my best shape while fighting him. But those were in the end, excuses. The fact that someone could overwhelm me, no matter the method or drawback was completely unacceptable. I was trying to become the strongest in the history of this world, so being the strongest present living being was the bare minimum in my opinion. There were people like Ugwe, Jindao, Kai, and even future Po who were all stronger than me than I was now. 
To add salt to the wound, these were all people from China. If we take the whole world, was I confident that I was the strongest in the world right now? Although as a world of Kung Fu China naturally dominate the rest of the world when it comes to strength, the point still stands. Even Wu Bao was someone unknown. Yet he was that powerful. It really opened my eyes that many things happened during my imprisonment and there were hidden threats in this world. It was unacceptable. I needed to get stronger. So much stronger than I am right now. I wanted to be able to take down kingdoms and empires by myself. Being the strongest when it came to a one-on-one -on -one fight was not enough. I was not trying to get stronger through mastering Kai alone either. Especially when I was a unique case that had two Kai inside the body. I did not even know when I will be able to use Kai like I wanted to, so I needed a different way to get stronger. Luckily, I have just the right method to get stronger. It was the greatest boon I had, one that was soon to make me stronger than ever before. Knowledge of another world. It was not limited to one world either, as the modern world contained the knowledge of other different worlds in the form of fiction. Thought to be fiction, but they were real. I was the proof of that so that means that other world thought be fiction, there was also real. In my past life, I was a kung fu enthusiast who thought and dreamed of nothing but kung fu my entire life. I spent my entire life practicing real kung fu and other forms of martial arts. Not only that, I had the hobby of reading stories, novels, manga and watching animes, movies, TV shows etc. that have anything to do with marital arts. Coupled with the knowledge I had from this world of Kung Fu, by mastering the 1000 scrolls of Kung Fu, which was all the Kung Fu Ugwe had created my knowledge of martial arts, and Kung Fu was vast. Master Ugwe was the creator of Kung Fu, not the creator of all Kung Fu styles that existed in this world. So I was not kidding when I said I might surpass Ugwe's knowledge when it came to different styles and techniques of Kung Fu. But the question was whether I could replicate and use that knowledge in this world. Could I use martial arts from different worlds? Say, maybe Renewal Taekwondo, Water Stream Rock Smashing Fist. At first, I thought no. Different world works with different logic and power systems, so I shouldn't be able to copy them. Maybe use the theory behind them to create similar styles. But then I realized, I could create miracles on a small scale. While I was in a state of inner peace and my Kai became one with the world, I could achieve impossible feats. I can do more than just catch cannons which should be logically impossible. I can do more than enhance my senses. I could do more than slow down time in my perspective. The people in this world were backward even with all the wisdom that Ugwe had. When it came to imagination and a way to use a power, he would fall short. In a piece, the ability to create miracles on a small scale. It might not be much to people born in this era like Po and Ugwe, other than a basic enhancement, but for me, the one who possesses off-worldly knowledge. It will make all the difference in the world. It's like giving a dagger to someone with hands and someone without hands. The one who would find more use with the dagger was the one with the hands. Similar to that, I have something special. Something which both Ugwe and Po did not have even though they might be the chosen one of the universe. I have a cheat of my own. Ha 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 I started laughing madly as my laughter echoed through the pool of scared tears. It was the place where Shifu trained Po to be strong enough to face me. It was also said to be the birthplace of Kung Fu. I had come here in hopes of finding out a method I could use to get stronger and improve myself. And just like I had hoped, I did it. I made a breakthrough. Shunpo or flash steps. It was a special movement that let you move from point A to point B faster than the eye could follow. The concept behind the technique was covering a distance with the least amount of steps. It sounded impossible if you did not have the Riyatsu, or if you were not a Shinigami. How am I going to cover the same distance with lesser steps? Should I take longer strides? It was not logical and you would need a miracle to do it. But with the help of inner peace and its ability to create small miracles, I will be able to do it. I can create that miracle which I would need to execute that technique. Although I still cannot affect the outside world as a master of Kai could, I can at least achieve the impossible when it comes to my own body and the area near me. That was all I needed to copy other martial arts and techniques. It would be more than enough to make up for the difference in logic or power system. What other techniques could I learn and replicate? Rocky Shiki. I would love to get Tekai for my defense. It would be easier to replicate techniques rather than an entire martial arts. I have to be wise in what I choose to copy, as too many techniques would ruin my fighting style. I need to choose techniques that would suit my fighting style and master new techniques one at a time. But the first thing I needed to learn was a movement technique. The world of Kung Fu Panda was extremely lacking in movement technique, especially one that suited my style. So this will be the first technique I learn, Shunpo slash flash steps. After all, as a martial artist once said, in the world of Kung Fu, speed defines the winner. Cover a distance between point A and point B with the least amounts of steps are. I asked myself while walking to a place that had an open plane where I could move freely. It doesn't sound too complicated. There are more nonsensical techniques in this world. I said to myself as I finally began my journey towards strength. I did not need to follow this universe's path to strength. I will create one on my own. A true warrior makes the best of every advantage and weapon he is gifted with. Let's put that to the test, shall we? The ability to create small miracles within a piece. My knowledge of different worlds and my genius in Kung Fu. Let's see how far that can take me. Tai Lung's POV. It is wise to rest sometimes, son. 
I heard Shifu's voice from above as he was looking down on me from a cliff. I did not even look up to meet him as I continued focusing on training. In front of me was a giant clay pot nearly twice my size. The pot was made of a thin layer of clay, so it was extremely fragile. Even if a civilian were to punch it, it would surely break, since it was also filled to the brim with water. I have no time for such things Shifu, I said and continued focusing on my Kai, which was covering my body. After months of training, my Kai was not merely leaking out but I was controlling it. I focused on the feeling of my Kai, willing it to do my bidding as I visualized the miracle I wanted to create. It was not just a miracle as I had a somewhat logical explanation behind it. A theory, and I have seen others do it in the form of an anime. The level of miracle I needed was a small one, just enough to make the technique pop and come to life. Armament technique colon, internal destruction. I said and punched forward with breakneck speed. But my fist stopped right before hitting the clay pot. My punch stopped, yet the force behind the attack did not disappear. Instead, it traveled forward a few inches without even needing a medium. And then my attack landed. Boom splash, my attack went through the clay pot and directly exploded the water it held. The water splashed violently like a volcanic eruption, and almost all of it was emptied. Yet as I looked at the clay pot, there was absolutely no dagum on it. My attack had skipped the exterior part and only attacked the interior. I needed to get more proficient in it so I could use it in an instant without even having to put much focus. I needed to make it second nature, like a normal punch. I developed this technique because of Wu Bao. To truly put him down, I needed to push my hand down his throat and attack his internals that way. Although it worked that time, I didn't want to rely on that again. What if he had not opened his mouth to roar? Then the fight would have lasted longer, and who knows what could have happened. Then there was also Po, who had a special body that imitated rubber or balloon. Blunt attacks were very ineffective while fighting him, so this technique would be of great help when we fight again. I will be able to defeat him even easier. After I master this, I won't have to worry whether my opponent wears armor, has Iron Hide possesses a special body etc. I would be able to attack their internal organs directly. Congratulations on creating yet another lethal technique. Shifu said and I looked up at him. I held back a laugh when I saw his wet state. Although he was a red panda, he looked more like a wet raccoon. But again, I must advise you as your master that you rest for a day or two. He said and before I responded, he put up his hand to stop me. I know you are busy developing these new techniques and getting stronger than you already are. But quote he said wisely, the time to relax is often when you don't have time for it. You can't really argue with that. It has been a few months since I have been constantly training to get stronger. And my only rest consists of sleeping, eating or when I was training the Furious Five and Po. I guess I shall meditate then. I said and was about to sit down before Shifu sighed and pinched between his eyes. Meditation is also another form of training. What I mean by rest is you having fun or being idle. He said, fun. I processed the word in my mind. I have never had what normal people would deem fun both in this life and in my past life. You don't master different kung fu and martial arts at the young age of 24 by having fun after all. But I was also constantly having fun training myself and getting stronger. I had plenty of fun when I pushed through even when my cells screamed at me to stop and when I abled my body to do impossible feats. As I looked at Shifu with a dumbfounded expression that hinted I clearly had no clue what he was talking about. He sighed and said, something fun. Like going around the village or buying things in the market. The villagers hate me, I said. Although the only crime I committed against them was laying waste to the village 20 years ago. The people in all of China hated me. It was because no matter how small my crime seemed when there were literally bandits and assassins who turned into masters who then became loved. It was a different case. It was because of my unparalleled strength coupled with Ugwe being the one to deem me evil. Ugwe was basically like a Buddha to them, someone who held great power and had lived for a thousand years, while also having wisdom deserving his age. There were some who even worshipped him. Give it a few hundred years, and they might make a legit religion for him. As the creator of Kung Fu and the master of Kai who achieved impossible things and saved the world from demons, that was the admiration he held amongst the people of this world. So when such a person said he saw darkness in me, the whole of China believed him. They saw me as more evil and sinister than even actual evil villains themselves. His influence could be seen in how the whole of China believed in the prophesized warrior, the dragon warrior, although such a thing never really existed before. When he selected Po, they simply believed it without even questioning a thing. His mere words could even turn my own father against me. In simple words, they were a bunch of NPC. They don't hate you son. Shifu said his eyes were sad for me, they are merely afraid. What's the difference Shifu? I asked, fear breeds contempt. People naturally hate what they fear. He stayed silent, arguing with me no more. I have gone to the village multiple times, and each time the reaction was the same. If I did not save the world or something on that level, my reputation and how the people perceive me would not improve. I stopped trying. They can hate me if they want. At least, I now have my father and my juniors who see me as I am. When I became the strongest and build a legacy that even surpassed Ugwe's, they would change their tone real quick. 
It was not like there would be a lack of opportunity to save the world, either as long as I stick with Poe. A long silence stretched between father and son before it was broken by Shifu's movement. He leapt into the air and slowly fell towards me by riding on a falling leaf. King Kun, I thought of the Kung Fu Shifu was using to make himself weightless. It was an extremely difficult Kung Fu to master. But when you do, you can lighten yourself to the point that you are as light as a feather, and you can even walk on leaves. You remember this? Shifu asked me as he landed gently on the ground, like a feather. The art of balance. I said and when he gave me a cheeky smile, I felt annoyed. Exactly, the art of balance. You, my son, were never one to be balanced. You were always on either side of the extremes. Shifu said, even with all your genius, it took you five years to master this Kung Fu. I looked away, a little embarrassed at that fact. It was truly shameful that it took me that long to master it. When Shifu himself mastered it in a few weeks, and I remembered Po mastered it in a matter of days. Such a stain on my reputation as a peerless genius. Come, walk with me, son. I will show you how to free your spirit and have fun. Shifu said and leapt into the air. His soft and gentle push took him to the sky with his light weight. He landed on top of a tree, his whole weight being held up by the leaves as he waited for me. I sighed. I never really liked Hing Kong even after I mastered it. Do not allow the weight of the world to control you. Instead become weightless and take control of the world that was the concept behind Hing Kong. You need to have an absolute balance of the mind and the spirit and walk the way to the art of balance. I never use this Kung Fu because, in my mind, my attacks should have the weight of a mountain behind them instead of being weightless. I believe I needed to be as destructive as a volcano instead of a feather. It was not suited for my Kung Fu which emphasized destruction. But that doesn't mean that I can't use this type of Kung Fu. I rejected the weight of the world as I observed curiously, how the Kai inside of my body changed my weight. It was such a curious thing. I have only been capable of feeling my Kai like this after months of meditation and inner peace. The Kai in your body can make you achieve miracles when it comes to your body alone. Inner peace just makes it much easier and allows you to make miracles only with your will alone, plus giving you the ability to influence objects other than your own body. This would explain how I was able to make myself weightless, how Mantis could be so strong, or how Poe's body was like a rubber balloon. It was all because Kai, the fuel of miracles as I have come to call it. I realized that after all the training and research I did, the only difference is that someone like me who achieved inner peace, had a much easier time doing it. Everyone in this world was allowed to create miracles, but the people were unaware because they don't have outside knowledge like I did. They can't look at their lives from an outsider's perspective. To them, some things just make sense. Like how Manta's small body can be so strong, how ducks can fly with clothes on or with small wings, etc. Kai was such an interesting energy that left me with more questions the more I learned about it. It was very narrow, but at the same time vast in what it could do. I shook off my thoughts as I felt my body become weightless, and I leapt towards Shifu. A day of rest shouldn't hurt or slow down my progress by much. Let's go. Shifu said with a smile as we leapt from one place to another. With our weight that of a feather, we were carried by the wind. We took to the skies, unchained by the world. We took control of the weight of the world instead of letting it control us. It gave me the feeling that my own fate was in my hands. My destiny destiny, mind to shape. I looked at the smiling face of my father as we gently rose and fell, scaling the entire valley, and I couldn't help but reminisce about the past, when we first flew like this when I mastered Hing Kong. The day went by quickly as I spent time with my father. In the end, I think I had fun. Tai Lung's POV it has been 10 months, nearly a year since I have been living in the Jade Palace. I had become stronger than I could ever hope to during these past 10 months. My decision to copy techniques and martial arts from different worlds proved to be more than just genius. It was heaven shattering. And I did not use that sentence to sound funny. Okay, maybe a little, but it was worthy of such praise. I could now confidently declare to the world that I am the strongest. There was no doubt in my mind that there were no one who could match me if I went all out. I am the strongest. Although, claiming to be the strongest in history was still something I could not do. Because even with all the things I have learnt and my new familiarity with Kai, I could still not use it like a master of Kai would be able to. I cannot extend my Kai to affect a large area or someplace far away. And I cannot yet blast around Kai like Kamehameha or make Rasengan. I could not mold my Kai as I wanted. The most I could do was use it as fuel to create a miracle I visualize in my mind. I was yet to be able to manipulate Kai directly. But with my knowledge and creativity, I was sure that I would be able to match someone like Poe from the fourth movie, and Kai with his own Kai. That means I could match a normal master of Kai with my inner peace alone. I did not know what was stopping me from mastering Kai. I remembered in the third movie that people who knew themselves could use Kai easily. Am I the son of a panda, son of a goose, a student, a teacher? Turns out I'm all of them, I am the dragon warrior. 
Po declared and used Kai. Po, you taught us who we were meant to be. A father. Po's dad said and used Kai. A friend. Tigra said and used Kai. A family. Mr. Ping the Goose said, although that was weird as a person with knowledge of the modern world, I give it a pass. But God forbid someone said, a nunchuck chick, before using Kai, dumpling kicker, a hugger, stripy baby. They said these bullshits before being able to transfer their Kai to Po, which was fucking ridiculous because I can barely make trees move with mine. In the end, I almost chalk it out to them being a panda, but the damn goose and tigress were able to use Kai too. Just like that. It was not hard for me to use Kai as fuel to create miracles, but to manipulate my Kai itself was almost impossible. After a long time of thinking, I realized that the only explanation was the fact that I had two Kai inside of me. Maybe that was stopping me from manipulating my Kai. I could not understand why I was unable to use Kai otherwise. I have attained inner peace and during my imprisonment, I have already answered the question of who am I. Nevertheless, I did not give up. I am Tai Lung. I said and put my hand forward. Nothing. I am the strongest. Still nothing. I am both human and a snow leopard. Nope. I am a villain. Nah, uh, the son of Shifu. Cricket sounds, I took a deep breath and decided to try one last time. I focused on my Kai, and I felt the world listening as I spoke the next words. Throughout the heavens and the earth, I alone am the honored one. Wait, is that nope? I am the rejected one. Nothing. Okay. This was not working at all. Clearly, I have worked out who I am, but it was other things that were the problem. I stopped my private Kai training and decided to work my body instead, so I went towards the training ground. It was early in the morning before dawn, so it was still very dark and chilly. Although I was a snow leopard, I still had a blanket wrapped around me as I quickly ran to the training ground. When I reached the training ground, I was not greeted with the silence and emptiness that I was hoping for. Instead, someone was training. My yellow eyes pierced through the dark as my natural night vision as a cat came into play. I was able to see Tigress training in the training ground all by herself. I couldn't stop my lips from stretching into a proud smile. When I saw her using her claws to attack the pillar of iron, which I had bought for her, when she asked me to teach her how to use her claws, instead of training like I was planning to do, I opted to leap up the roof of the training hall and watch her from there. I sat down and got comfortable as I watched her train with a smile. She might not be as talented, but she had similar obsession for strength like me. The unquenchable thirst to improve, the need to be stronger than yesterday, and a reason to push beyond her limits. I wonder what that was. What reason does she have to constantly train to improve? The position of the dragon warrior was already filled, and she had enough strength to protect herself and be respected. So why? Why was she doing it? What was the purpose behind her desire for power? Hi Aya, she screamed as she swiped at the heavy pillar of iron in front of her. Her claws left a deep mark, but that was it. She took a breath and rested for a few minutes before she slowly walked back. After a good amount of distance was between her and the iron pillar, she closed her eyes. She got into a stance. She lowered her center of gravity and got on all fours, like she was meant to be. A predator ready to pounce. I raised an eyebrow when I saw that familiar stance. It was mine. After what felt like an eternity, her eyes snapped open, and she shot towards the iron pillar. She was a blur, but my eyes followed her movement, and I noticed the exact moment when her claws turned black. Just like mine. Phew, her body cut through the air and her claws through the iron pillar. She stopped when she was behind the target as the iron pillar slowly fell down, separated into three pieces. Remarkable she stood up and her claws slowly turned to normal, as she stopped strengthening them with Kai. She had a wide smile on her face as she looked at the broken iron pillar. Clap clap clap. Her eyes snapped towards me as I started clapping my hands. Surprise colored her face when she saw me, and I noticed a blush on her face. I leapt down the roof and landed in front of her. Truly remarkable. I said and paused to show her my proud smile. She became flustered as it was not often that I smiled. You can celebrate, you know. Jump around and scream giddily as much as you want to. There is no one except me. I said and she raised her eyebrow before she gave me a toothy smile. I did it she screamed and jumped around like an excited girl. I did not disturb her and let her enjoy her moment of achievement. Hardcore my ass, she was just a kitty inside. Will who she screamed to the sky before looking and pointing at me. I beat your record. Indeed, it took me half a year to learn it. But you only took three months. I said, and her smile grew wider. I wisely held back from mentioning the fact that I was 14 years old. Sorry for my outburst. That was unsightly of me. Tigress said while hugging her knees. The earliest ray of the sun was shining down on her, making her red fur almost look golden. We were sitting on the roof of the training hall, and the awakening world below was for us to gaze at. I chuckled and patted her head, she buried her face a little deeper in embarrassment. You don't need to act like that towards me. After all, you are my little sister in all but blood now. I was equally proud if not prouder. She gave me a smile and nodded at my words. Tigress was a pitiful girl. She had told me her past before, she was an orphan, but due to her unnatural strength everyone in the orphanage called her a monster and she spent most of her time locked up in a room. She was a tiger, 
And not only that, she was supernaturally strong even for her species standard. She locked herself away, afraid to hurt other kids with her strength which she had yet to learn how to control. That was until Shifa came and taught her Kung Fu, so that she could control her strength. After she was done learning how to control her strength, she eventually got accepted by children her age. Yet adults were still afraid to adopt her, so she thought she would always be alone. That was until Shifa came and adopted her as a daughter. So naturally, her only parent figure in family was Shifu. But because of me, she never really got the affection of a father from Shifu. After hearing that, I ended up feeling a little guilty and began pampering her as much as I can. I was more than happy to act as a brother for her. Here, wrap this around you. I said before taking off my blanket and covering her shivering body. She had just finished training so her body was cooling down and exhausted, add the chilly morning air to the mix, and she was cold. She tried to resist, but I easily forced the blanket around her. In the end, she accepted with a small voice. Thank you. I was a snow leopard so the cold did not bother me much. I could also heat up my body with Kai if I really wanted to so there was no need to thank me. But I just gave her a nod as we sat side by side, watching the sun rise on the horizon. It was beautiful. I couldn't express enough how beautiful my world was. The modern day landscapes and beauty were nothing in front of this. We stayed quiet, none of us bothering to speak as we are both not the talking type. Yet we felt comfortable with each other, enjoying each other's company. There was no romance around us though, only a familial bond. I did not know if it was because she was so much younger or because of the memories of my past life as a human, but I could not see Tigris that way. But that was not a problem. I liked the bond we had, so I felt a bit hesitant when I said, I will be leaving. Though Tigris did not react much, she just stayed silent and processed my words until she was ready to speak. When? I will give one final teaching to all of you today and I will leave tomorrow. She nodded. She did not ask me to stay longer or express her desire to come along with me. Maybe she did not want to be a bother, or maybe because she still thought we were not that close for her to ask. I have done everything I wanted here. I have studied in the library and had the peace and privilege to train as much as I want. And now, it's time to go out to explore the world. See how much China had changed during my imprisonment, but most importantly, seek out opponents. I have learned and mastered many new techniques during my training, and now it's time to test them in real combat. It will be like my heydays when I travel around China and seek out different masters to a duel. Where will you go? Tigris asked. I am planning to visit many places, but I will start with someplace familiar, and where I can find worthy opponents for certain. I said and turned to her with a smile. The city where the Kung Fu Council resides, Gongmen City. I revealed with an excited smile. She stayed silent and observed my face. Then she asked with a tone of doubt. You think you can beat the Kung Fu Council? I was caught off guard by her question before I started laughing out loud. Had they really hidden the truth in order to save face? Wrong question Kitty. You should ask, you think you can beat the Kung Fu Council again? I said. And my answer would be, absolutely. In fact, I will beat them worse. Tai Lung's POV. I stood at the courtyard just outside the training hall with Shifu by my side as we watched the Furious Five train in the training ground. The students were fighting each other, and the way they moved and fought was very different from 10 months ago. Their kung fu and their style had been soaked in my nature. It was the consequence of my training and teachings. They have certainly gotten stronger, Shifu said, but then he smiled an unsure smile. But I am questioning if it is good or not. I scoffed and thought to myself, how can being stronger possibly not be good? I watched as Viper wrapped herself around a dummy and completely broke it down piece by piece. She did this by wrapping herself around the limbs and squeezing in such a way that she broke every joint of the dummy. She could do more than just choke her opponents or control their limbs to make them hit themselves. She was perfect for jujitsu. The body of animals had hundreds of joints, not just movable joints, but the places where bones meet bones. I made sure Viper studied them, the joints and bone structure of different animals as I taught her how to dismantle her opponents that way, snapping their joints until her enemies were at her mercy as she turned them into broken puppets. I have also taught Manitz how to turn himself into a living bullet. Now he bounced around at the speed of sound, and used his entire body to pierce through his opponents. His small body made him unable to exert much force in his attacks, and most of the time, due to his small mass, he could never strike with another person. But I taught him to use that as an advantage. He was small, and that meant a smaller target for his opponents. Plus, it reduces the surface area of his attacks, and it gave him a devastating piercing nature to his attacks. Monkey also learned to use his feet like hands. I taught him how to use grappling which was quite an unorthodox style of kung fu, but it fit well with his body. He now climbs on his opponent and tries to bring them down like a three. I strengthened his grip and made him utilize it. The simple act of grabbing was something rare amongst the masters in this world as only a few animals had hands. But the improvement he made the most were in weapons. Monkey was always a weapon master, so I taught him how to be a spear and a bow staff. He was already quite proficient in it, so it was not hard to show him some new tricks he could use. Tigress also learned how to use her claws. That increased her threat level massively, as having claws was like being perpetually armed. Tigress had been someone who had to control her strength from birth. 
She was always too strong so when others trained to get stronger, she trained to be weaker and control her strength. That naturally had a psychological effect, and she had trouble using all of her strength, much less going beyond it. So the sparrings we had where she was actually the weaker one helped her improve by leaps and bound. Lastly, I had taught Crane many battle strategies and tricks he could use, since he was the main brain of the team. In a real fight, he would fly high in the sky and coordinate the attacks of his teammates while also coming up with plans and strategies. So I made him study a lot of war and battle tactics. I don't see the problem, I said with a smug smile. I was proud of them and the improvements they made with my guidance. Don't you think it's a little ruthless? It's not like we are in war times for them to train such lethal techniques. Shifu said his thought while touching his beard. It's always better for them to learn than stay ignorant. You can teach them to hold back if you desire a more merciful style of combat. I said, a sword in a sheath is always better than no sword. Of course. Shifu said, and we continued watching them train for a while. Until he asked me another question. I heard you are leaving tomorrow. I raised an eyebrow. Tyrus told you. Yes. Shifu said and chuckled, she told me not to tell you this, but she was asking me if it was possible for me to make you stay for a few days longer, or if I could order you to take her on your journeys, at least for a few days. I shook my head with a smile, so, are you going to ask me? I agree with her, it was sudden, for you to leave tomorrow, but I don't think I have the authority to tell you what to do and what not to do. You can decide on your own, Shifu said, and her eyes turned to Tigress who was on the training ground. She had grown attached to you. Shifu said, I am glad to see you two get along like brothers and sisters. For someone with the hardcore style, she is extremely soft inside, I said. Ten months was not a very long, and I did not have much time to spend with them since I was busy with my own training. The fact that she had grown so attached to me was a testament to her need for love and her emotional and soft nature. Well, you are her brother. I smiled, indeed. Tigress was my adoptive sister, and I have come to see her as such. She was still young and had a great future in Kung Fu so I couldn't help but grow close to her as well. Where will you be heading? Gongman City. I said, I'll pay a visit to Master Thundering Rhino, and check out the new Kung Fu Council that he made. Should I be worried? Shifu asked. He was aware of the many new techniques I had created, so he should know exactly what I was planning to do when traveling around. It will be like my younger days when I traveled around China to challenge every famous fighter and master I could find. At one point, I even participated in wars and helped kingdoms fend off attackers. No, but expect some rumors. I said while looking at him with a knowing smile. Shifu simply smiled back. Right then Po opened up the gate to the training ground with a giant bag on his back. With the sun being at the midpoint of the sky, I'd assume that was lunch. Guys Po screamed, lunch is here. Alright X4 let's go. The Furious Five stopped their training and ran to Po. They helped him settle down before they sat on the ground with multiple dishes and noodles. They started eating and praising Po for his hard work. Po still holds the job of a water in his father's shop, so until noon, he rarely joined the training. But even with that, his genius made him match Tigress when it came to fighting prowess. I think even he doesn't realize his own strength and genius. Shall we join them? Shifu asked him without even responding. I turned into a blur, and in just a second, I was already near the students. Did you get mine? I asked Po to which he quickly reached into his bag and took out a special lunchbox. Of course. He said and gave it to me, the Tai Lung special. Yum. I said and nudged at Monkey to move so I could sit with them. I opened the lunchbox, and inside were noodles and a bunch of dishes which I requested. There was even an egg sandwich among them. Make sure to thank Mr. Peng for me. I said and started digging into my food as I sat alongside my juniors. Shifu also came down and took a bowl of noodles which he ate while standing beside us. We had a small talk as I enjoyed the company of the people who were the closest I had to a family. There can never be a moment of silence with Po, as he shows off how many dumplings he can fit in his mouth. I enjoyed the last day I would be spending with them for a while. It was peaceful and warm. Moments like these are what makes a person rich. After all, it is not the number of days in your life that you remember. You remember moments like these. Goodbye? I said one final time before I descended the steps of the Jade Palace. I wore a traveling cloak, and I had a small drawstring bag where I put money and an official letter from the Jade Palace. I also carried the Dragon Scroll inside, because it meant a lot to me even if it was blank. It had affected a huge portion of my life, so it held sentiment. Stay safe, son. By Tai Lung, Po said with a sniff, before he started crying for real and leaned on Tigress's shoulder. Goodbye Master Tai Lung. Viper waved at me good-naturedly. We might have a bumpy start, but we ended on a good note. Don't miss me too much, I am going beat all of you when I get back, so you better train hard. I said with a wave. All of the residents of the Jade Palace, including the servants, had come to bid me farewell. It was a nice gesture on their part. After I went down the first three sets of stairs, I disappeared in a blur. It was the beginning of a new adventure for me. Tai Lung after leaving the Jade Palace, I made my way down to the village with my cloak covering my body so that no villagers panicked or freaked out when they saw me. It would be a lie to say that I did not care about what the NPCs thought of me, since I was the guy who wanted to be the Dragon Warrior, a hero admired by everyone, so the unjust perspective people had of me was a great annoyance. 
It was truly baffling how they forgot the countless times I had saved the village and protected the valley in the past. 25 years ago, the Valley of Peace used to be under the protection of Tai Lun, and I made sure to extinguish whatever or whoever was threatening it. I went on countless missions under Shifu and Ugwe's order, and even with my own free will. I was sent to settle disputes between kingdoms. I caught criminals, killed masters who had turned evil and saved many lives. I used to bring prosperity and peace to not just the valley, but to China as a whole. As the future dragon warrior, I thought it was my duty to do such things. To protect the people and to serve the land. I take pride in that. My father took pride in that. I used my strength and I used my influence for them. I was a tool, diligently doing a duty which was never meant to be mine. Gladly too. With pride. No, I was not a tool. I was a fool. Would it be possible for me to tag along on the carriage? I heard you guys were going to Guangzhou. I asked the cow lady with ripped muscles. My past human self would have called her mommy. Jokes aside, her posture and foot placement told me that she was at least trained in Kung Fu, and her eyes which constantly scanned her surrounding with a certain level of intent, hints at experience in battle. We were currently in the vegetable market of the village of the Jade Palace, and using my acute sense of hearing, I heard her discuss her travel plans with a rabbit from far away, and I instantly approached them. Guangzhou was a trading town located a few hundred miles away from the village. The road leading there was good and wide, so it wouldn't take longer than a couple of days to reach there. Gongmin City was further down the west from there, and since the road leading to the city was busy and long, I planned to travel on foot from Guangzhou onwards. But for the first part of the journey, it would be easier to tag along in a carriage. Guangzhou was the main trading place for the village, as it had a little bit of everything, and they would buy things at a much higher rate than other villages. So many traders and businessmen travel back and forth from the village to Guangzhou. I am willing to pay a dozen bronze coins. I said to the cow who just kept looking at me, she must be curious to know what I looked like under the cloak. Not gonna happen. Honey, she called and pushed the carriage slightly, and a small rabbit peeked his head out. Yes, this guy wanted to tag along, even said he was willing to pay a dozen coin. The cow said to the rabbit which I now assumed was her husband, there is no problem at all from my side. You are the one pulling the carriage dear so whatever you say. The rabbit said, you heard him, get in. The cow lady said, and I tossed her a dozen bronze coins which she later used to buy carrots for snacks. I went behind the carriage and there were only empty boxes, making plenty of space for me to sit. It seemed they were going to Guangzhou to buy and not sell. I had to wait a few minutes before the rabbit finished arranging the boxes, and we were off to our travel. The cow lady said we would reach Guangzhou in two days. Oh by the way, my name is Jiang Liu and my beautiful wife there is Chang'in. The rabbit man said pointing at his wife who was pulling the carriage. I did not return the polite gesture and simply nodded without introducing myself. The guy seemed to take no offense but I saw his wife clicking her tongue. It seemed she was the feasty one, the typical marriage between a hot-tempered and a gentle soul. I sat cross-legged at the back of the carriage and spent my time meditating. But as the journey continued and we left the village, there was silence which prompted Mr. Jiang Liu to start a conversation with me. So, where will you be heading young lad? I don't assume you want to go to Gunagzar since you have the bare necessity for travel. He asked me. Guangzhou was a trading town and most people go there to trade. It seemed I did not look the part. You'd be correct in your assumption. I am heading to Gongmen City. Oh, the land of fair ladies and fireworks. Do tell me which one you are aiming for. It's for business, I replied. The white rabbit scoffed, like hell I believe that no one goes to Gongmen City for business. Gongmen City was the land of fireworks and entertainment, so if you are a traveler wishing to go there, people would assume you were there to enjoy life. It held the same reputation as Las Vegas would in the modern world. So you got a maiden of your own yet? No. Plans on getting one soon? No. Well, as a married man, I can tell you that you are losing out. The rabbit said and looked at his wife outside who was pulling the carriage. Really? I heard it's quite a hustle. But, nonsense. There are jokes around that but in truth we can never be happier. He said with a smile. The world is cruel and lonely. You would be a damn lucky bastard to find a partner you can walk with. Someone to be with you every step of the way in this journey of life. He said to me. I could see the cow outside blushing as steam came out of her ears. I never thought of it that way. I said and looked at the odd couple. It was not rare to see other species marry each other or become partners. But as one might expect, they could never have kids together. If they want kids, they either have to adopt or the husband never the wife hires a surrogate. But that was reserved for the rich. That was why adoption was very popular. It was also why Po never found out he was adopted. In his eyes, it was not weird that his father was a goose. Because he saw many other kids with different species as parents. Orphanage were a busy place with kids getting adopted all the time. Hence why Tigress was very pitiful to not get adopted, as most adults were afraid of her strength. Our journey went on as we had small talks. I was beginning to enjoy the conversation a little as Mr. Jiang Liu proved to be a knowledgeable person. He even told me about how he met his wife. Chang'in came to the village in hopes of getting into the Jade Palace as one of the students, but she ended up in his arms instead. She might not be a student of the Jade Palace in the end, but she was trained in Kung Fu. Honestly, I noticed that quite early on. So you do not want to mess with her, or me for that matter. I may be small, but my wife will fuck you up. He said with a laugh. 
It was because of her kung fu skills and strength that we never even bothered to hire bodyguards. She can take care of these lackluster criminal all by herself. He said proudly, strong, beautiful and kind. I really used up all of my luck by having her, though the roads have been peaceful these passing months. He said, I am glad since I never really liked watching her fight, although I knew she could take care of herself. I smiled softly under my hood. I have been clearing the bandits and thieves camping in the valley a lot, so it was no wonder that there were lesser attacks. Using inner peace to heighten my senses, it was not hard to locate the criminals camping in the forest of the valley. I would use them to test my new techniques and take them out to help the valley. It was unacceptable that those criminals were disturbing my home. If it were in the past, no criminals would dare step into the Valley of Peace, fearing the wrath of Tai Lun. It's always nice to see the positive result of the work you do, no matter what it was. People were happy and safe. I am glad to hear that. I said, yeah, it has been a blessing for all of us travelers and traders. There had been no noteworthy robberies or ambushes. It had brought great prosperity to the valley. He said with visible enthusiasm and a fond smile on his face. I smiled too, a little proud and satisfied. It's really thanks to the dragon warrior. He has been doing a splendid job, just what you would expect from a warrior prophesied by Yugui himself. First, he dealt with Tai Lung, and now he had brought peace in the valley. He said, yes, it is true. I have never seen roads as peaceful as the road of the valley, these passing 10 months. It is truly a miracle that only the dragon warrior can achieve. His wife added from the front, still pulling the carriage. Oh, I muttered and blinked. I see. Well, we are extremely lucky to have him, Mr. Jang said. I got comfortable in my seat again, leaning against the inner wall of the carriage. I closed my eyes and meditated to get the wrong feeling off my chest. The journey went smoother than expected, and we reached the trading town of Guangzhou in two days. I bid farewell to the two lovely couples, and I made my way to Gongmen City. I did not follow the main road and cut through the difficult terrains, and took a shortcut to Gongmen City. But before reaching the city, I had to take a ferry to cross the Lake of Eternal Pearls or Pearl Lake. The road went around the lake, but that would take an extra day. But with the help of the ferry, I crossed the lake in a single night. After nearly five days of traveling, I reached the metropolis city known as Gongmen City Tai Lung's POV Gongmen City was a metropolis, filled with many business opportunities and trades. However, the sheer amount of resorts and other entertainment establishments located in the city made it famous as the dream city in all of China. The city was busier than even the likes of Milan City. I looked around curiously at the epitome of prosperity and wealth of ancient China. Gongmen City was an independent city which was under no empire or domination. Although it was just a city, they could compete with any other kingdom when it came to economy. It was home to many of the wealthy people in China, and it always held a deep connection with the Kung Fu Council, and before that, Master Flying Rhino. The city was also surrounded by rocky mountains, that made it difficult for an army to attack, coupled with the Kung Fu masters with whom they had a relation, no kingdom or empire could threaten Gongmen City. Their relationship with the Kung Fu master went so long back and deep, that when the rulers of the city, the peacocks all died out, Gongmen City came under the Kung Fu Council. The city was divided into different districts. There were districts for entertainment, trade, gambling, markets, living quarters of the soldiers slash Kung Fu masters, the district where the rich lived, a district where the commoners lived, etc. At the center of the city was the ancestral palace of the peacocks, a place where the current rulers of Gongmen City reside. I just entered Gongmen City, and I was in the Travelers District. The place was teeming with hotels, brothels, taverns and different restaurants. That would give a much needed rest to all of the travelers that came to the city. It was the first district and one of the busiest districts too. It also acted as a port where you could hire ships and workers to transport cargo. No one bats an eye towards me as I fit right into the crowd. It was not uncommon for people with hidden identities to visit the city. They could be nobles who wanted to enjoy life, but did not want their reputation ruined, kings and even monks. People knew to keep to their own business. Oh my you look like you can use a rest. Well, maybe not this one. I stopped and turned to the seductive gazelle. He had decided it was wise to approach me. She wore a skimpy red dress, and from her appearance, you can say that she was extremely beautiful for this world standard. I raised an eyebrow. Judging from her dress and from her beauty, she was a prostitute and with a high rank too. Red was only reserved for the most exquisite girls after all. The question was, why did someone like her approach me? Instead of seeking out customers, there must be males lining up to spend a night with her. But here she was in the streets and she approached me first. I'm sorry but I have no coins to spend the night with such a lovely lady. I said politely and walked past her. I think it was my other life as a human affecting me. But I could no longer find the females in this world too attractive. That did not mean I was not going to marry or have kids in the future. It just meant that if I was not emotionally attached to a girl. I did not desire to mate with a random female. I find them beautiful and I can appreciate them. But it lacked the lust that should be there. The gazelle who approached me could be said to be the top beauty in this world. But her invitation did not even faze me. Wait sir, I did not say you need to pay. She said and came in front of me again. She smiled coyly and put her hand on my chest. You can have me without paying. Just promise to accept one favor I have in the future if we meet again. She said. That made me pause. 
I meet her eyes and I read her expression. Did she know who I was to want a favor from me? In the end, I realized that she was just someone with the ability to tell the strength of a person. There were many different animals in this world, and many of them had skill sets unique to them. So it was not rare for a prey species of an animal to be able to tell the strength of someone with one glance. Like they were made to discern predators from the mass, they could tell apart the strong from the rest. She must have noticed me, and when she realized how absurdly strong I was, she must have thought I was some powerful master who came to the city while hiding my identity. To own the favor of a kung fu master was priceless in this world ruled by strength. I suspect that this might not be the first time she approached a strong master. I looked at her from top to bottom, she was tall and slender. But she had the right amount of fats where needed, and she was very curvy. There was also this alluring vibe around her, like the aura females had when they were ovulating or they were in heat. I'm not interested, I said and walked past her again. She just stayed rooted in her place, shocked that she was rejected. As I was walking past her, my ears caught a conversation taking place in front of the building opposite to me. We have fresh fish caught just this morning they are completely fresh, and we serve it in the restaurant. Six copper coin is a huge steal. The owner of the restaurant said to the incredulous sheep who was hesitant to dine in the restaurant. I stopped. Did they just say fish? Meat. I'll take that I said loudly while raising my hand. Everyone was looking at me, and even the gazelle I just rejected looked at me in shock. Wonderful come on in sir. The owner said and I excitedly went into his shop under the stumped eyes of the gazelle. I don't need animal pussy. I need meat. Wait, that sounds kinder dash. This is peak. I said while stuffing my mouth with the masterfully cooked fish. Fish was the only source of meat you can get in this world. But even then, it was not a popular food. Especially if you didn't live near a lake, you will never eat fish in your life. But here in Gongmen City which was located near the Pearl Lake, fish were plentiful. They did not export it though, since fish spoil too quickly, and the unpopularity made it unprofitable even if you know how to preserve it. This restaurant was special since they served the best fish dishes. They did not have much customers, but they always had loyal predator animal customers so they could keep the business going. Right now, the restaurant was mostly empty, with four leopards sitting at the other end of the restaurant being the only other customers. I would have said it was perfect if not for the shameless gazelle sitting beside me. I gave her a side eye and noticed how she was choosing only the noodles and vegetable part of the dish, and she pushed around the fish's meat with a disgusted expression. I would have asked her what she was doing if I had not known she would answer with something like can't I eat at the restaurant? Do you own the place? Let's ask her anyway. What are you doing? What do you mean what am I doing? I am eating. Can't I eat at the same restaurant as you? She replied. Called it. I meant what are you doing with your dish? Do you not like fish? I asked. Yes. Do you want it? Yes please. Sure. I am not repulsed with the idea of helping you. I said and she gave me all the fish meat from her food. Are you with the Kung Fu Council? Did you come early for the tournament? She asked offhandedly. I raised an eyebrow. What makes you think that? In fact, what makes you think I am a Kung Fu master at all? She smiled. I have this ability to tell how strong a person is. And with the time I had spent in Gongman City, I have encountered many people even famous warriors. Yet you are by far the strongest. She said and I smiled. At least she was honest. If that is the case then I did not mind returning the gesture. I am not with the Kung Fu Council but I do have some business with them. It's why I came to the city in the first place. I said and her eyes sparkled. So, are you like a warrior or guardian of a kingdom? She asked, oddly interested in me. But I guess it couldn't be helped. Either her pride was hurt due to my rejection, and she wanted to shoot her shot again, or she was curious about me, and felt that it was nice to be treated normally once in a while. You could say that. Technically I was the guardian of the valley and the Jade Palace. Though I am curious about what you said before. A tournament or something. I asked, since she was so persistent in learning more about me. I could use her to gather some information. Oh the Gongmen Washu competition. As you know, Gongmen and its citizens love entertainment so every three years. The city holds a fighting tournament with the participants being members of the Kung Fu Council. The members can even reach higher positions in the council if they do well in this tournament. She explained. Although you are three months too early. That sounds interesting. I asked the gazelle more about it and also got the information necessary for navigating the city. She was very helpful, and in the end, I told her I would remember her name. After eating my fill in the restaurant, I ventured deeper into the city and went sightseeing at the different districts. The buildings of Gongmen City were grand and made of bricks and stones, unlike Milan City, where it was made of brittle wood and paper to prevent disasters from happening. When the grizzly clans went berserk, I took the great city for a while. But eventually, I reached my final destination. The Ancestral Palace of the Peacocks. The place where the Kung Fu Council currently resides. It was their main headquarters. Third POV Master Thundering Rhino. He was young once. He was bold, foolish and reckless. But most importantly, he was strong. He was the son of the renowned warrior, Master Flying Rhino. And unlike those sons of great figures, he did not fall under the pressure of having such a great father. He was strong, so he thrived. He let his own strength and fame get to his head. After he fought against 10,000 serpents in the Valley of Woe and came out as the winner, he thought he was unstoppable. He became prideful and boasted about his achievements. 
He declared, I am the strongest of my generation, a statement he wholeheartedly believed in at that time. That was a wrong move. That was a grave mistake on his part. He had invited a disaster upon himself, he had no excuse. He came. What is this nonsense I heard from across the country? You must have been pretty loud. He came knocking to his father's castle. A snow leopard. I am Tai Lung, the dragon warrior. And I have come all the way to see what the strongest of my generation was like. He said with a smile. He is mocking me. The young rhino thought to himself. A jewel. He thought he was strong. No, he thought he was the strongest. He realized during that fight, he was not strong. He was delusional. He put in all of his strength. He used every technique his father had taught him. He fought harder than he ever did before. But he was just embarrassing himself. In front of Tai Lung, his best was a joke. Tai Lung was just too fast. It was then that he launched his most powerful attack yet. He put everything behind the attack. To take back his honor, to take back his pride. But Tai Lung shut it down with a joke. That was a nice hit of course unless you were aiming for me. A joke? A sentence that haunted the great master thundering rhino ever since. He opened his eyes coming back to the present as he looked at the platform where his two students sparred with each other in preparation for the upcoming Washu tournament. He gripped the mighty warhammer in his hand and tried to shrug off the bad memories of the past. He did not know why he was reminiscing about such times all of a sudden. He was no longer that young rhino, bold and foolish. He was now the ruler of Gongman City, leader of the Kung Fu Council, and renowned as the strongest living master right now. Master Thundering Rhino. There was no one in this world who did not know his name. People sing praises of him and retold his tale of glory. Unlike Tai Lung who was hated by the people. His story was not one of disgrace and evil. Tai Lung could never compare to his glory now. Greatness was being accepted by the people. And he will never be accepted by the people. Master Croc, make sure you guard your abdomen next time. Your scales cover your backside. So use spinning attacks, defend with your back and spin to attack. Not only will it make you unpredictable, it will give more momentum in your swings. Rhino advised his student. Now, again he said, prompting his two greatest students, Storming Ox and Croc, to begin sparring again. He hit the ground with the butt of his warhammer to accentuate his order. It would not be wrong to call them his two greatest pupils, yet it won't be right either. His greatest pupil was Wu Bao, the guardian of Milan City and the number three spot in the Kung Fu Council. Sadly he was no more, he was ruthlessly killed by Tai Lung in his rampage. Page. Tai Lung, Rhino thought and squeezed the handle of his warhammer. He will get vengeance for his student someday. He was confident in beating Tai Lung, who wasted 20 years rotting in jail. On the other hand, Rhino had grown a lot and got stronger during the past 20 years. If they were to fight against, the fake dragon warrior would stand no chance. He had heard about the news of his escape before. Not just he, but the whole of China was aware of the escape of the villain deemed evil by Yu himself. There were many rumors about how he immediately brought chaos to a tavern, how he rampaged in Milan City in his anger, and even killed the guardian of the city. Not only that, he later had the audacity to claim that it was a duel to the death initiated by Wu Bao himself. That fucker, of course, Wu Bao would initiate a duel to the death to prevent having you attack the people. Later on, it was said that he fought with the dragon warrior and somehow, the prophesized warrior was able to earn Tai Lung's respect, and he admitted his inferiority. That seemed to be a big hit to his pride as he stayed cooped up in the Jade Palace, under the surveillance of the dragon warrior ever since. If only he came out of the Valley of Peace, Master Rhino would have sought him out for battle. It was sure to be easy to defeat someone who had not grown in 20 years. Maybe he was redeemable, Rhino mused to himself. After losing his pride, maybe he will be able to set Tai Lung on a good path. He was brought out of his musing when he saw Gazelle walk towards him, confidently rocking her child-bearing hips. Rhino had to stop himself from lashing out when he saw her dress. Tell me Gazelle, why are you dressed as a slut again? Rhino asked and pinched between his eyes. Gazelle stopped and looked at him with a shocked face. That is not how you talk to a lady. She pushed her hair and touched her ass. I am not letting you have this cake, like ever, because of that comment. Rhino scoffed, who would want to associate with a female that mastered Long Mei Kwan, a kung fu that takes advantage of seduction and charm during a fight. The ability to release pheromones at will that could throw any male opponent off, fighting in a way that would distract the eyes, using your own beauty to make the opponent of the opposite gender hesitate to attack you etc. It was all under the Kung Fu of Long Mei Kwan. It was a rare Kung Fu. But in the hands of Gazelle whose beauty and species complement the Kung Fu, it was a dangerous combat style. Anyways, as your informant, I have something to report. Gazelle said in a tone a little more serious than before. She was the main source of information for Master Rhino and the Kung Fu Council. In return, she was allowed to own all the brothels in Gongman City. They lure in traveling males to these brothels and simply ask for information. You only needed to give them some drinks and a pretty lady to ask, and the males will tell you more than you wanted to know. They would boast about what they did, what they have done, and what they were going to do to impress the ladies in there. Due to this, they even held the secrets and dirt of many other kingdoms. There was even a noble who boasted about the defense system he built for his kingdom, retelling all of its strengths and structure in hopes of impressing the beautiful mare and antelope of the establishment with his intelligence. He was a pig and insecure about his body, so he was proud to boast his intelligence. What is it? Rhino asked. A strong unknown master had entered Gongman City. I do not know his identity. 
but he claimed that he was a guardian of a kingdom. He also had a long tail and liked eating fish, which made it likely that he is a lion, tiger or leopard. Rhino hummed, is that all? Hum. Gazelle put her hand under her chin, deep in thought, he was also digging for information about the city. It seemed that he was quite ignorant in that regard, so he probably came from somewhere far from here. Somewhere far. Is he from Dali? Rhino asked himself. Dali was a kingdom in the south of China in the Yunnan province. The kingdom was also filled with tigers. Anyways, thank you for the information. Rhino nodded in acknowledgement before throwing a string of gold coins at her. The coins had a hole in the middle which can be used to put them together in a string. Well thank you, Gazelle caught it and with a smile, she turned around to leave. Sorry, I got to go. I have a few customers waiting for me. She said, and as Rhino watched her, she put an extra pep in her steps, boldly shaking her fat ass. What a slut. Rhino thought with a frown, yet she wouldn't let me tap. He grimaced before smiling at his thoughts. 46 years, and he was still full of vigor. He was at the prime state of his life, a point in a kung fu master's life, where their experience and physical strength were balanced and at their peak. He continued teaching his students for some time, and before an hour passed since he got the information, he heard a commotion outside the walls. The palace had a huge area surrounded by walls that could fit an army. There was also a platform which they used to spar and hold tournaments. Master Ox and Croc both stopped their sparring, and they all looked at the main entrance gate of the palace walls. There was a huge wooden gate fixed with metal, and it was tightly locked from the inside. The commotion died down and there was silence. The silence persisted until it did not. Go on. The gate was knocked off its hinges with a single attack, as the giant gate fell down under the might of whoever was knocking. The sound shook the entire surrounding and he came in. He wore a dark cloak and had a drawstring bag on one shoulder. He carefully looked around the surroundings before his eyes landed on Master Rhino, who was standing at the top of the steps leading to the palace. They could feel him smile. He took off his hood with one move, and the identity was revealed. The others did not know who it was, but Rhino's eyes widened in recognition. Tai Lung. He smiled. It was the same mocking smile Rhino remembered. His face had not aged even a bit. I heard you were talking a lot again. They called you the strongest living master, so I wanted to see it for myself. If you had grown to deserve such title, Tai Lung said. No. Master Rhino's body froze. Why did all this seem so familiar? It was the same as last time. Maybe it was that realization. Or maybe he was angry at Tai Lung for killing his student. Or maybe it's because Tai Lung infiltrating his city. Maybe it was a bit of all of them. The ground where Master Rhino stood was completely devastated as he shot towards Tai Lung at a speed which broke the sound barrier. His speed was so fast that sound couldn't catch up. That made his sudden movement as silent as it could be. His mighty body easily sliced through the air, and in less than a second, he was floating in front of Tai Lung. Master Rhino brought up his mighty warhammer, and with all his strength, he slammed it down at Tai Lung. Tai Lung brought his hand up and caught the head of his hammer, a move that completely caught Master Rhino off guard. Yet he put in all of his strength. Tai Lung would die because of his foolishness. His figure suddenly seemed like the size of a mountain, because that was the amount of weight behind his attack. His eyes glow red as he looked down at Tai Lung like he was a corpse. The sound of his approach and the sound of his attack exploded in sync. A deafening explosion materializes in the palace ground. Whoosh, booyom. The ground beneath Tai Lung opened up to scream, as the full weight of Master Rhino's strength pressed down on it. A shockwave that was strong enough to blow the servant ducks off their feet erupted from the clash as it shook the entire foundation of the palace. Huge cracks started spreading under Tai Lung's feet as the earth crumbled like ash. The force was strong enough to shake the wall, until it completely collapsed. The clash lasted one moment, and an eternity as unstoppable strength met the ultimate technique. The attack settled reality finally processed what just happened, and the result was revealed. The onlookers' eyes nearly bulged out when they saw Master Rhino still suspended in the air, as he continued slamming down his hammer which was caught by Tai Lung using a single hand. Tai Lung seemed unfazed, and there was not a single scratch on his body. Yet the traumatized earth under his feet spoke volumes of Master Rhino's strength. It was almost like Rhino completely missed the attack and hit the earth instead. The force of the attack had skipped Tai Lung's body entirely, and only affected the ground. But that was impossible, indeed. It was a miracle. Tai Lung revealed a smile when he met the eyes of Rhino, who looked equally shocked and amused by the display. Then Tai Lung repeated the same words he said to Master Rhino 25 years ago. That was a nice hit of course, unless you were aiming for me. He said equally amused and mocking. Ha 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 Master Rhino laughed madly and they separated. Tai Lung's POV I went towards the wall surrounding the Palace of Peacocks, or better known as the Towers of Sacred Flames, because it was the place where fireworks were made. The walls were tall and thick enough that it instill a feeling that I was tiny compared to the mighty walls and palace. I headed straight to the main entrance gate, and I was immediately ordered to stop by the goats and deer guarding the gate. I did not know whether to laugh or cry when I saw their skinny frames void of muscles and their half-ass weapons. Stop right there one of the guards yelled at me, 
but I chose to ignore his order and continued walking towards the gate. I said stop. He yelled and he was the first to charge at me. I dodged his incoming spear swiftly and with a single touch, I attacked his nerve, and he fell paralyzed on the ground. He is attacking the palace stop him the others called out, and all of the guards which were a dozen or so charged at me. I resisted the urge to tell them my ancestors ate their ancestors, and I swiftly put them down with a single nerve attack, one by one. They were only slightly stronger than the average civilian. It truly baffles me why they were appointed as the guards, but I guess a bunch of kung fu masters living in the palace did not really need guards. After I took them all down, I slowly walked up the wide steps and stood before the mighty gate. I gazed at it with a smile, before I put a hand forward to touch the gate. Open sesame. I whispered before pulling back my arm and slamming a Kai-infused punch right at the center of the gate. The hinges of the gate exploded violently before the mighty gate collapsed. As it hit the ground, a loud crashing sound was heard, and the shockwave stirred up a cloud of dust. I strode in with confidence worthy of the strongest. I looked around the open area and immediately noted down the other guards present there. I scanned the surroundings and made sure there was nothing that could threaten me, before my eyes finally fell on the ruler of the city, Master Thundering Rhino. He was much bigger and more mature than I remembered. He had a warhammer on one hand, and I also saw the battle scars which his clothes could not hide. He was stronger than before, astonishingly stronger. That put a smile on my face. I took off the hood of my cloak and revealed myself to the world. The other masters did not seem to recognize me except Master Rhino, Tai Lung. He named me, and I heard the others gasp as they finally caught on who I was. I let the information sink in their mind before I spoke with a smile towards Master Rhino. I heard you were talking a lot again. They called you the strongest living master, so I wanted to see it for myself. If you had grown to deserve such title. I saw Master Rhino completely freeze on his spot when I said that. I smiled. He seemed to draw a parallel between the past and the present, just like I did. He was having a PSTD episode, and I couldn't help but have nostalgia. But then everything stills. My first stood on end as my instincts honed through years of training screamed at me. My vision turned black as a gigantic mountain of a rhinoceros loomed over me. His red eyes looked at a corpse as they shone with the color of his sky. They looked at me. I wasted no time and put my hand up to catch the incoming swing of his warhammer. My hand made contact with the head of his warhammer, and that was when I finally realized just how much power was slamming down at me. The force was enough to pulverize a mountain. My Kai erupted out of my body, and my eyes shone with brilliance as I entered the state of inner peace in that single instance. I did not need movement or focus. After all my training, I could enter the state of inner peace in a heartbeat. I caught the head of his warhammer and instead of trying to push back the force, I accepted it in my body and allowed it to flow through my muscles. Shaori the ultimate defense. By relaxing my muscles to the very limit, I made it something akin to liquid as I felt the force flow through my body. Normally, the body made of flesh and bones had a limit on how much force it could absorb or redirect, but with the miracle achieved through inner peace, I was able to let the force pass through my body, and let it exit under my feet. It was a mix between Shaori and the concept of internal destruction, where you can make the force behind your attack skip through armor. Only this time I made my body into that armor. The violent force behind Master Rhino's attack exploded under my feet, leaving my body unscratched, as in a show of absolute mastery over body and force. I had redirected the force of his swing to the ground. Wooosh Buyuom. The earth beneath my feet was forced to bear the full weight of the attack, and it was left completely devastated. That was a nice hit of course, unless you were aiming for me. I said the phrase I often used to taunt my opponent in the past as I stopped his attack. I had completely caught Master Rhino's attack, but I couldn't help but sweat a bit. That was such a frightening show of power, and the force behind that swing was so much that I couldn't even redirect it back at him like I wanted to, and had to immediately let it out on the ground. That was just how strong he was. If I had not trained 10 months before this, the fight between us might be close. He was almost as strong as Wu Bao in Berserk mode. And imagine, that much strength in the hands of a master of kung fu with a clear head. That was truly an exciting thought. Master Rhino pushed himself away from me and landed near his students. He looked at me with a shocked face, but there was a smile of amusement on his face. A smile that quickly turned into a laugh. Ha 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 ha. I scoffed and started chuckling too while looking at him. The guy was so shocked that he started laughing. Of course, of course. He said, wiping away the tears in his eyes due to laughter, you are Tai Lung after all. Only you would be able to use his time of imprisonment to attain inner peace. So that was what he found funny. I thought to myself, also noting his impeccable observation. He was able to tell how I was stopped his attack in an instant. For a moment, I believed you would stagnate after 20 years in prison, and I would have been the superior warrior by a long shot. Master Rhino said and hit the ground with the butt of his warhammer. As long as I am not dead, I will always come back stronger. I said with a smirk. 
He shook his head and his chuckles slowly died down before he got serious again. So Tai Lun, he said, what is a criminal like you doing in my city? I felt my eyebrow twitch when he called me a criminal. I took out the letter of the Jade Palace from my drawstring bag. Before throwing it at Master Rhino, he caught it and opened the scroll before reading the letter inside. It was a letter written by the Master of the Jade Palace himself. The letter stated that the Jade Palace took back their declaration of me being a criminal. The Jade Palace was the one who braided me as a criminal, and since they took back their claim, I was now innocent. As you can see in the letter, I am no longer a criminal. I said and he shifted his gaze from the letter to look at me. And I am on a journey to seek out warriors to challenge, just like the old days. He stayed silent for a while before looking at the letter again. In the end, he sighed. It seemed Shifu had grown soft for his son. That comment would have cost him his horn if it was me right after breaking out of prison. So you have come to challenge me. He said and threw the letter back at me. I caught it before swiftly putting it back into my bag. I would be more than happy to accept your challenge. I have more than a few reasons to fight you as well. He said and hit the ground with the end of his warhammer again. However, as you are the guest of the city you will be treated as such. You may rest for the day, and we will have the match tomorrow. He said with a small bow. That was how people with real strength were treated in this world. Although Master Rhino truly hated me and believed me to be a criminal, he also respected my strength as a warrior. And he had just learned that I was an enlightened one who had attained inner peace. That was undeniably superior to him as someone who had not attained such a state. Even in the whole of China, those who attain inner peace can be counted on one hand. That's the reason why he was acting as polite and respectful as he could. Sounds good to me. I shall allow you a one day delay until I defeat you for a second time. I said and I saw his eyes twitch. I might have admitted I was not as superior to you as I thought I would be, but that does not imply I am not stronger. He said, I have grown much in the past 20 years. This won't go like last time. Your words would be put to the test soon. I said and I blurred from my place before I appeared in front of him. Speed had always been one of my strong points, so even without using flash steps, I was too fast for the naked eye. The only reason Mantis appeared faster than me was because of his small size. The other onlookers eyes widened when they saw me instantly appear in front of Master Rhino. He was very tall standing at more than 12 feet, but I stared directly in the eye. Very well then, he said and it was agreed that we would have a duel tomorrow. I could not wait to test my new techniques on his behemoth of a body. I was sure he would be able to take a hit. After that, he guided me towards the top of the steps, and he ordered his students to resume their training. We stood side by side as we watched his students spar with each other. He asked me about my opinion on his students, and how they compare to the Furious Five. Of course. I made sure to praise the Furious Five, and I boast of their talent like any proud senior would. He also asked me about the Dragon Warrior and the rumors around the fight we had. After seeing my current power with his own eyes, he found it hard to believe that a newly appointed Dragon Warrior could match me. Of course, I made sure to clear the misunderstanding, and I also told him how the Dragon Warrior held the greatest potential I had ever seen, surpassing even the likes of me. Even more talented than you. He must be truly an extraordinary warrior if he can make you admit that. Rhino commented in surprise. I shook my head talent can only get you so far. You of all people should know that it takes more than talent to reach where we are. Poe is still young, he still doesn't even know who he is. I said and Master Rhino nodded. I stayed talking with Master Rhino and watching his students spar for a while before I decided it was enough, and I took my leave. I went around the city once more, and this time I visited the east district of the city, which was more reserved for the actual citizens of Gongman City. I went around their market, curiously looking everywhere and enjoying the busy city instead of the peaceful village for a change. But as I was walking around the common market of the city, I was suddenly halted by a voice when I passed by a small bridge. Tai Lun. I turned around cautiously as the person called me by my name. I was wearing my cloak, and no one was supposed to know me. That was when I met an old goat who sat under the shade of the small bridge. She laid a cloth before her where she was displaying small trinkets which I assumed she was selling. I did a double take when I saw her. Soothsayer. I called her and she smiled. Tai Lung Soothsayer. I called her and she smiled. She was sitting under the small bridge. And she looked like an ordinary old goat. But she was nothing but ordinary. She used to be the trusted advisor of the royal peacocks. And as her name suggests, she was a soothsayer, someone who could foresee the future. I quickly scanned the surroundings to see if there were guards secretly protecting an important figure like her, and also to see if we attracted any attention, by calling out each other's names. You look splendid my boy, she said with a fond smile. And you look like you could die of old age any moment. I turned back to her and replied. Her true age was unknown, but she was the advisor for the royal peacocks since the beginning. She held that position for many generations. But now that the peacocks were all gone, she no longer held such position. It could be said that she was one of the main reasons why Gongman City was as grand as it is now. It was through her ability to foresee the future and advice. Oh shush you, she said, I have lived a long life. But I am sure I would outlive you. And your son, and your grandson. And your grandson's grandson. Sounds like a lonely life ahead of you. It is. 
You should have proposed to Ugwe while he was alive. I said and she was taken aback. She coughed in embarrassment and red found her cheeks. She always had a thing for Ugwe. I realized that when I was young and we all went to Gonjum City for the coming age of their Prince Shen. It was an unspoken secret to be honest. She was so different whenever she was around Ugwe after all. Don't bring up such things to an old lady. She said and tried to keep cool. You had hundreds of years. I don't know how you fumbled so badly. I teased her. It was nice to see her so thrown off while I knew without a double. She wanted to act wise and mysterious. Well, Ugwe always valued his peace. And a wife seemed like a complete opposite to his desire and belief. She said sadly. Hopefully, he is now truly resting in eternal peace. I smiled at that. I knew he was not at peace. And he must be busy fighting Kai right about now. I couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction at that thought. I am sure he is. So, she draws and looked up and down at me. What brings you to Gonmen City? Last time you said you hated the city due to the constant fireworks. I was no stranger to Gonmen City since we often visited it while I was a student under Shifu. It was a big city, and they always admired Kung Fu Masters. Therefore it was kinda like a place of congregation for Kung Fu Masters. This way, the city was favored by masters and in times of need, would be more than happy to help the city fend off invaders. So if you are a master worth your title, you would naturally like the city. It was kind of ironic how Shen in the second movie made a weapon that was meant to end Kung Fu. He resented his parents and beliefs so in a petty way. It was the reason why he hated Kung Fu and its masters. After years of imprisonment, I thought it would be a good idea to travel around and see the changes. I said, and naturally I had to visit here first when I heard the city had gone under the rule of Master Thundering Rhino and the Kung Fu Council. Your thoughts? It's insufferable as ever. I said, my senses were constantly overloaded due to the scent, noise and the bright fireworks that frequently exploded in the sky. They were annoying and put me on edge. It was not just Gongman City in specific either. I never really liked big cities, and would prefer a quiet village instead. Su Seiya smiled, I see. Well, at least the city is in good condition. The Kung Fu Council had exceeded my expectations in how they are ruling the city. We went silent after that, and I looked at the mundane trinkets she was selling. But amongst them, the bowl of prophecy caught my eyes. Was she really selling that? Su Seiya. Would you mind looking at my future? I asked curiously. I had a feeling that it won't work on me or at least it won't tell the truth since I was an anomaly. But I really wanted to try it. The royal peacocks forbade her from telling the future to anyone else. While she worked as their advisor. But now that she was not bound by such position, I reckon she should be able to look at mine. I don't do that anymore. She said, after what my last prophecy had led to, I had refrained from looking at the future again. She must be talking about Shen who went crazy due to the prophecy, and ended up committing a genocide. He thought he was saving himself from the prophecy by killing off the pandas, but his own action to prevent it had sealed his fate. Like Ugwe used to say, a person often meets his destiny on the road he took to avoid it. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy. She must be blaming herself for all the deaths of the pandas, and forgiving the prince a self-fulfilling prophecy. I can understand how she no longer wanted to tell the future Dash, although I shall make an exception for you. She said, cutting off my thought. Really? Yes, I am curious. You are not supposed to be here. She said with a glint in her eyes, and I cannot see even a little into your future or what you might do. I see nothing. I remember in the movies that she had the ability to see the future of anyone she looked at, at least a few seconds into the future. This was not explicitly stated, but it was shown in how she was seemingly one step ahead whenever she dealt with someone. But what do you mean I am not supposed to be here? I asked although I knew exactly what she meant by that. I might not have talked about it, but I have seen your future. She said, this was not supposed to happen, you were meant for something else. You changed your own future, something I thought only Ugwe and the Dragon Warrior were able to do. She said thoughtfully, so yes. I shall look into your future, she said and put out her hand, give me your hand. I put my hand on top of hers, and I thought she was going to read my handprints, but she plucked out my fur instead. Ouch. She was not done as she quickly clipped off my claw with a cutter. I was quick to pull my hand away as I stared in disbelief at my claw which was chipped off. My claws were supposed to be tougher than metal, capable of cutting through iron with ease. How did you dash my words were cut off when I turned to look at her? But she was no longer there. I immediately felt her presence behind me as I winced in pain when I saw her pluck the fur from my tail. Hey I said and grabbed my tail away from her. She came back to her position and put everything in her bowl. She threw in a few other items which I did not know. Before she finished off by throwing gunpowder in there. The gunpowder exploded and her eyes went white. Thick white smoke was released as they gathered to form an image. I see. She said while humming and her eyes were completely white. I see. I could feel how Hakai and the Kai of the world were doing something. I was not able to sense exactly what was happening. 
But I knew something was happening. I watched in rapt attention as the smoke turned into different colors to form something. It was soon revealed to be a snow leopard. It was me. A warrior unlike anything the world had ever seen. She said while she continued humming. With a heart that could not decide black or white. Not a villain yet far from a hero, draped in the shades of gray. She said and the smoke highlighted my gray fur. The path you walk shall not lead to glory as you wish. Your quest for validation a failure. She said as the snow leopard in the smoke knelt down in defeat. For destiny is not kind to those who defy her. The universe worked to right the accident. She said and continued humming. There were beads of sweat on her face as she tried to look further. History remembers a villain you never wished to be. Your legacy and ambition died at the hands of someone whose is was forgotten. She said and the snow leopard in the smoke was suddenly destroyed by a green light. She continued humming and tired to see further and more detail, but she failed. In the end, her eyes returned to normal, and the smoke disappeared. She was breathing heavily, and she seemed shaken by what she saw. Her shaky eyes locked on mine as we stared at each other. I took in the information and the prophecy for a few seconds before I smiled. The future does not look good for me, does it? I chuckled. Soothsayer shook her head at that the future was not bright for me. Did I at least get a smoking hot snow leopard as a girlfriend? I asked jokingly. But surprisingly she nodded. You can say that. She said. Damn. Although it is weird. I could not see a concrete future for you. I can only tell the present and the failure of your ambition. Not how or when. I can't even see the person who defeated you. She said thoughtfully. This is way above my power. Well, thanks for the prophecy. I will keep it in mind. I said and threw her a couple of silver coins. I will leave you then. I said and quickly went away from her. I might act calm and unaffected. But I was completely shaken inside. Not in a bad way though. I did not despair as I was an anomaly. I could change anything. I have done it before and Shutseya said it herself, she couldn't see it clearly. But to think that I would be defeated in the hands of Kai. To be honest, if I was to ever be defeated it would be him. He was not only powerful, but he could steal other people's Kai. And that can make him more powerful. And to even face him you need to be a master of Kai. Something which I was far from being able to achieve currently. If things happen like canon, I knew he would return in a few years. Would I be able to become strong enough to face him? I don't know. Damn it. I thought to myself as I made a beeline to the first district of Gongman City. I went to an inn and booked a room for a night. I immediately went into my room and mediated to process my thoughts better. Maybe it would have been better if I had not asked for the prophecy at all. Because even though I knew it was not certain, it affected me. In a piece. I said and spent the rest of the night in that position. Tylung's POV. I stood on the roof of the Tower of the Sacred Flames as I looked at the city below. The tower was ten stories high and was the tallest structure in all of Gongman City. It was visible even miles away. Although I was so high up, my eyes were easily able to observe the people below, specifically at the Kung Fu Council who were waiting for me at the arena outside the palace. There were more people than yesterday as this was an official duel, and many people wanted to witness it. Other than the normal guards stationed around and the nobles, I saw six masters there. Master Rhino, Master Ox, Master Croc, the gazelle whom I thought was a prostitute, but was actually also a master from what I saw and heard, Master Elephant, and finally Soothsayer were also there. I looked down at how the guards were stationed and carefully checked if there was something fishy going on. I knew it was unlikely, but it was always better to be cautious, for all I knew Shen could suddenly appear during a fight. After seeing that nothing was out of the ordinary, I let out a sigh. It would be wrong to say that I was as enthusiastic as I was yesterday. The future that Soothsayer described had left much for me to think about. It made me question the path I was walking and the plans that I had made. It also left me with yet another realization that I was still not strong enough for the upcoming threat. Kai, the warrior who was going to defeat me according to what Soothsayer had described. If I could not grow strong enough to face him, nothing I did right now would matter. If it was Kai in his base. I had no doubt that I could defeat even a dozen of him as I am right now, but Kai's real strength was in the Kai that he stole. Not to mention the fact that I would need to master Kai just so I could face him without having my own Kai stolen. He was an almost impossible opponent to defeat. The guy would have stolen Ugwe's Kai even before he came back to the mortal realm, coupled with the fact that he stole other masters Kai, and that he was a spirit warrior who could never get exhausted. I did not like my chances against him. I need more power. I chuckled at that thought. Forty years and I was still chasing after power. The reasons have changed, but the pursuit remains the same. One step at a time. I said and looked at the vast infinite horizon. And what better first step than beating the leader of the Kung Fu Council? I said and leapt down from the roof of the tower. My body sliced through the frigid morning air, and I descended towards the arena like a falling star. I flipped in the air to slow down my momentum before I landed in front of Master Rhino with a small shockwave. I was afraid you'd never come. Master Rhino said with a smirk, and I got up to my feet while slapping the imaginary dust from my fur. I have never seen someone so eager to lose. I said before cupping my fist and giving the Master Rhino a bow of respect. Although I was stronger than him, I must show respect as the challenger. He was the one doing me a favor by accepting my challenge when he did not stand to gain anything. He nods back at me in acknowledgement. I looked around at the observers and took a closer look at them. My eyes lingered on Master Elephant and his robust physique. 
He stood around 20 feet tall, and my senses told me that he was more of a building than an animal. Did you gain a few pounds while I was away Master Elephant? I asked with a smile to which the grumpy elephant scoffed. I am not the young bull I used to be Tai Lam. I would have taken you on if Master Rhino was not already doing it. Sure you were? I smiled. The last time we fought he could not even catch me due to our difference in speed. On another note, I never expected him to join the Kung Fu Council. I thought he was all about a strong bull not needing a group or backing. But I guess he had grown as he said. My eyes shifted again and fell on the gazelle with the alluring smile. She seemed equally shocked and amused to learn my identity. I was no longer wearing my cloak so everyone could see who I was. I thought you were someone who works horizontally. I said, choosing a more respectable word since I now knew she was not only a master, but a member of the Kung Fu Council. Oh honey, sorry to burst your bubble, but I don't do that. But if you beg me I might consider it, she said with a coy smile. I deadpanned at her which only caused her to giggle. So, Master Rhino draws while he robed his robe to reveal his bare torso. His body was filled with iron-like muscles ready to explode into action. Shall we start? I turned to look at him and with a smile, I agreed. I am ready when you are. He twirled his signature weapon the Warhammer, before he planted the bottom of the hammer on the ground. Do you have your weapon? My claws came out of my fingers, and they cut the air like sharp blades. Always. Master Rhino fixed his posture and got into a stance. He grabbed his hammer and aimed the head at me. I cracked my neck and in the next breath, Master Rhino shot towards me at a speed illogical for his size. His huge body caused a disturbance in the air, as he planted his feet on the ground when he was in front of me. Then in a perfect straight line, his hammer flew towards me. Since it was coming at me in a straight line, my eyes could not tell the distance it covered. It felt like it was not moving towards me even, but I knew better. I sidestepped to my left and let the hammer fly past me. The air exploded, and a small hurricane was formed due to the sheer force behind a single attack. He grabbed his hammer and pivot on his heel and swung it at me. I dodged it again by ducking down. The strong wind produced by his swing ruffled my fur. He quickly spun around and swung his warhammer overhead. The weapon descended on me and this time, it seemed even stronger. But with a simple twist of my body, I dodged the attack and stepped forward. I was so close to him that he had no way of attacking me anymore with his long weapon. I was in an awkward position for him to strike. Don't tell me that's all you can do. I said, my tone unamused as my eyes pierced his. He had gotten stronger for sure. But that was it. His kung fu remained the same, and as someone who already learned his style of kung fu as well, he was predictable. He was predictable and slow. Why don't you find out he yelled and threw back his head before he tried to headbutt me. I was shorter than him, so it was not difficult to lower my stance, and I delivered a Kai-infused punch right at his abdomen, which made him slide backwards. I massaged my fist afterwards. At least his defense was as impressive as ever. That hide of his was probably tougher than any armor. Swash a swift gale blew my fur as Master Rhino suddenly appeared behind me. His speed was drastically faster this time, and it almost caught me off guard. I moved away as quick as possible and turned my body to look at him. I immediately noticed the change he went through. His muscles had expanded and he appeared bigger than before. Not only that, but there was smoke coming out of his nostrils. What the my thoughts were cut off as he spun around and followed after me. He swung his warhammer at me, but strangely enough, it would not have hit me even if I did not move. His weapon swung past me in a gust of whirlwind, and he spun again. This time his weapon came towards me with more strength and power than before. He continued coming after me, swing after swing as I dodged everything with increasing difficulty. Because he was getting faster and stronger, I see. I thought to myself with a smile as I dodged his hammer which nearly blew my entire torso off. One hit and I was sure my body would explode into a pulp of flesh. Master Rhino spun his huge body around again, never allowing the force behind his swing to disperse. He was continuously gathering momentum and the more he attacked, the stronger he became. That way, even if he missed, his movement made his next attack more powerful. He was a master of his weapon as he used the weight of his hammer to balance his body weight. And in a harmonious way, he found a way to use both of that weight to create more force. Fuosh his attacks became increasingly dangerous, so I threw a powerful kick at him. My foot slammed against his body, but instead of damaging him, I nearly broke my ankle as his body was spinning with such force that my attack simply became a way to increase his momentum. It was an interesting technique. Hi Aya, he screamed out before he brought his hammer on top of his head and swung it down with such force that I felt the attack before it even landed. The air itself slammed down on me and my knees flexed to resist the sheer pressure. I realized then that even if I were to use Shaori or other techniques, I wouldn't be able to come out unscratched. I would have to turn my body into vibranium to deal with that attack. So the only way to deal with it was to dodge again. But I couldn't let his swings get stronger or gather more momentum. So I came up with a solution. I used flash steps to appear by his side in an instant. I saw his eyes visibly widen at my new display of speed. His hammer swung down beside me, and the air itself seemed to wrap around his weapon. I used my leg to control the trajectory of his hammer, and instead of letting him gather momentum again, I guided his weapon to smash the ground. A good idea on paper. But that might have been a mistake. Boom. 
The ground could not bear the force it was met with, and the arena caved in, and waves of force rippled out, as if we were in the middle of an ocean. The arena was made of compact concert to make sure that it was able to withstand fights between two masters. But at the moment, it might as well be a normal ground. The earth opened up, unable to hold the force, while also reflecting as much force as it could. That pushed me off my feet as I was tossed in the air. Oh, that was his plan all along. I saw a victorious smile on Master Rhino, as he threw his giant head up to slam at me. As I was in the air, the only thing I could do was move out of the way of his pointy horn, and I felt my body being thrown up in the sky. I did backflips in the air before I landed on the ground, but I was not granted a moment of respite as I felt an earthquake. Master Rhino was charging at me with his head down. I could dodge with flash steps, but I didn't. I threw a smirk on my face, and I pulled my arms back. When Master Rhino was about to slam at me, I threw a punch infused with Kai at his charging figure. But this one was different from a normal Kai infused punch, Black Flash. It was a technique that allowed you to increase your power 2.5 times and distort space if you time your attack 0.0000001 seconds with cursed energy. I did the same thing, but with the use of Kai. It was a little different than the original Black Flash. But with a few modifications, I could acquire the same result. Thundercorp. I called out the name of the technique inspired by Black Flash as the space distorted and blue lighting erupted from my fist. My attack slammed against Master Rhino's horn as we pushed each other back in a battle of force. There was an explosion of energy as a small hurricane materialized in our clash. The ground beneath our feet cracked like glass as we pushed each other for a moment of eternity. In the end, I was the one who lost as I was swept off my feet and slid back. Master Rhino stood up and shook his head. He was feeling dizzy and disoriented, so I took that as an advantage to attack. I used flash steps and appeared before him. I was so fast that I was able to stand half a second in front of him before he noticed me in his disoriented state. That was all I needed. Internal destruction. I said and threw a punch right at his chest. It did not matter how tough his hide was or what armor he was wearing. My attack went past all his defenses and exploded inside his body. He immediately grabbed his chest and fell on his knee. Blood spilled from his nose and mouth as his eyes shook. I did not give him mercy as I need him on his face. The attack did no real damage but it shook the brain inside his skull. My smile went wider as I grabbed his giant horn with both hands. Then I spun around and used all of my muscles to pull at him. I was not strong enough to lift him up. Even after strengthening my muscles with Kai, I was not strong enough to throw his heavy body around. But I had other solutions. My nostrils opened up to the limit as I sucked in huge amounts of air. A small vortex formed near my nose as I breathed in. Snow leopards lived in high altitudes and in cold temperatures where oxygen was scarce. Therefore they had powerful lungs and a large chest cavity to gather as much oxygen as possible. It might seem like a random fact to some, but if you know how to utilize that special biology, you can use it as an advantage. And with all of my knowledge in kung fu and fighting techniques, I knew exactly how to utilize my special biology. Some breeding I said in my mind as I used inner peace to create the miracle necessary to execute this technique of a different world. My eyes shone bright yellow, and my veins popped out visibly due to the rush of oxygen. Then in a feat of strength beyond my capability, I pulled Master Rhino's body and threw him over my shoulder like a ragdoll. Badrom his body crashed into the arena with a loud explosion as his body left a permanent mark on the platform specifically made to be durable. If this was in the city, it would have been enough to collapse towers and buildings. Luckily the arena was designed to accommodate fights, so even if this was the most intense fight I had in a while, we did not cause much destruction. I stood up and stepped back from Master Rhino's unconscious body, while I looked at my own hands. That's it. Was that really what the leader of the famous Kung Fu Council had to offer? Master Rhino was stronger than Wu Bao, possessing the same strength if not more than the bear, but also a clear mind while wielding such strength. But I have also grown stronger. With my new mastery over inner peace and the plethora of techniques I recreated and copied from different worlds, my total combat power had increased dramatically, even only flash steps had increased my already ridiculous speed tenfold. At that moment, I was left to contemplate how one could be so strong yet weak. I looked around and the audience all had looks of disbelief. I made beating Master Rhino look easy. From the nobles of the city, the guards, soothsayer and the masters of the Kung Fu Council, they all looked at me with a different light, a mix of horror and amazement. In their eyes, I saw fear. I couldn't help but start chuckling in the shock silence. I did not know what I was feeling at the moment, maybe I found it funny how I was this strong, yet it wouldn't be enough for the future. I stopped chuckling and turned my attention to somewhere else. My eyes skipped past everything else, as I focused on the figure perching on top of the wall far away. A white peacock in a hod, Shen. He was also looking at the fight. I noticed him while I was looking down from the top of the tower but I did not know it was Shen. He immediately ran away when he realized that I noticed him. The duel has been concluded. The winner is Tai Lung Master Elephant declared with a solemn face. Master Rhino's body twitched and he struggled to get up. His students soon gathered around him and tried to help him up. They glared at me as they helped their master. As if this was not a conceptual duel. 
I ignored them and instead made my way towards the wall where I saw Shen. But by the time I was there, he was already long gone. But I saw a single white feather on the ground. I took it and quickly put it in my pocket. Third POV Tai Lung. It was a name that was equally respected and feared throughout China 20 years ago. Especially if you were a Kung Fu practitioner, the name would strike both awe and horror in your heart. The first and the only person to master the thousand scrolls of Kung Fu written by Yugui, the greatest prodigy the world had ever seen and the best student of the legendary Master Shifu. Kung Fu masters used to call him the Arbiter of Humility, because he would come to put you in your place. If you became too loudmouthed about your achievements, in front of him, your achievements, your ego, and your talents were nothing. It was said that his strength could match that of a hundred master. His mere presence alone could force hostile kingdoms to make peace between themselves, and criminals would hope to never be big enough to catch his attention. For a moment everyone believed that he was the warrior of prophecy, the legendary dragon warrior. But that all changed when Tai Long got into a dispute with Master Ugwe. He was denied the title of the Dragon Warrior, and Tai Lung did not take it well. In the end, he was declared to have darkness in his heart, and branded as a criminal by Ugwe. An unexpected end to the greatest warrior of the generation. One that was said to only be second to Ugwe himself. Twenty years passed, and Tai Lung and his fame slowly died down. His legend and stories became mere nostalgia at the back of all the masters he had defeated. He was remembered for all the wrong reasons. No one remembered his great achievements of bringing peace to the land, protecting China against invaders, subduing infamous criminals who cultivated chaos, or making huge innovations in the art of Kung Fu. Maybe people did not remember him for all of these achievements, because had never done them in his own name. But in the name of the Dragon Warrior, the Jade Palace or Master Ugwe. In the end, Tai Lung was only remembered for his evil, his crime, and his audacity to go against the creator of Kung Fu. Everyone thought that was the end of Tai Lung, the epilogue of a tragic story. In prison for 20 years, history had nearly forgotten about its greatest genius. But after two decades of silence, he had returned. And just as you would expect from the warrior who was famous a long time ago, he brought a storm along with him. The complete destruction of Chorgon Prison which was the work of different kingdoms, combined to hold Tai Lung forever. The destruction of Mulan City and the murder of Wu Bao the Mighty Bear. This caused a chaotic shift in the trade of China. Finally, Tai Lung fought with the real dragon warrior. And even the warrior of prophecy was only strong enough for Tai Lung to respect him and show him mercy. After that, nothing else was heard from him for 10 months. Some rumors suspect that Master Shifu and the Dragon Warrior worked together to keep Tai Lung at bay and forbade him from leaving the Jade Palace to protect the world. So when Tai Lung was suddenly seen in Gongmen City and when he boldly challenged Master Rhino, Lord Shen had to come and see for himself. It was not hard for him to get the news, as there were plenty of people who thought he should be the rightful ruler amongst the guards. So he got the news the moment it happened. Tai Lung was a variable he had not taken into account in his plan. He always thought that the imprisonment was the end of Tai Lung, and that the warrior would never come back to disturb him. But now that that was proven otherwise, Lord Shen had to see it for himself, and make a change in his plan. Lord Shen had known Tai Lung, since he was a mere child. They used to visit Gongmen City frequently, and the Sacred Tower Arena was often used for duels between masters. Duels which included Tai Lung most of the time, and with him winning always. There would be no one better than him who knows the danger, and the power Tai Lung holds in his hands. It was what drove Lord Shen to develop destructive ways to use gunpowder instead of just using it for fireworks. He knew he would never be able to be as powerful as Tai Lung. Therefore, he created his cannons so that he would be able to match the power that Tai Lung holds. Or should we say to match the power of Kung Fu? Well, that was the same thing in Lord Shen's mind, Tai Lung was Kung Fu, the pinnacle of what the art had to offer. Lord Shen sneaked into the city and went to the ancestral palace of Peacocks, his rightful home. He hid on top of the wall and observed the upcoming jewel, and how everything went. For all he knew, Tai Lung could go on a rampage as he did in Milan City. Lord Shen would never allow such disasters to fall on his city. After a little bit of waiting, the match between Tai Lung and Master Rhino started. Lord Shen must have expected Tai Lung to get weaker or remain the same strength, since he was in prison for a long time, because he was absolutely shocked by what Tai Lung displayed during the fight. Not only had Tai Lung became more powerful as if he had not been in prison for two decades, but he had also achieved inner peace. And now, Lord Shen had to assign a whole new threat level to the Snow Leopard. The strength he displayed in the duel was enough to realize he could ruin everything for Lord Shen. After the end of the match, Shen had to run away from the place, because Tai Lung had noticed him. He cursed under his breath and made his way out of the city as soon as possible. After that, he went to the camp near the city where his follower wolves were camping, and around a couple dozen of his cannons were stationed. The Kung Fu Council had not found their camp because the place they were in was the farmland and house, owned by a respected noble of Gongmen City. Who believed that as the rightful heir. Lord Shen was supposed to be the ruler. Most of the nobles in Gongmen City and at least a quarter of citizens still believed that Lord Shen should be the ruler of the city and not the outsiders from the Kung Fu Council. His greatest crime, the massacre of the Panda Village, was a huge stain on his reputation, but in the end the pandas were just a random village and not even part of Gongmen City. 
Therefore, many of the nobles' houses and the people could excuse it as the mistake of a young prince caused by the prophecy. Lord Shen went inside the camp, and after taking his mind off by giving new orders to the wolves, he retreated to his cabin where he lay deep in thought. A new variable had appeared, and Lord Shen needed to change his plans. Even Tai Lung would not stop him from taking back what is rightfully his. Maybe it was just his paranoia. But while there was planning on how to deal with Tai Lung, the words of Soothsayer came into his mind. A peacock is defeated by a warrior of black and white. Lord Shen gritted his beak and shook off the thought. It should not be the pandas that the prophecy mentioned right, not Tai Lung. Tai Lung was gray and black, but that thought affirmed the threat of Tai Lung in his mind. And he knew that for his plan to succeed and for his vision to become a reality, he needed to somehow deal with Tai Lung. A tall task. But one Shen must accomplish to bring back the glory of the peacock. Tai Lung's POV a true appreciation for life's richness begins at the table, where the love for food transcends mere sustenance. So as I savored the meaty goodness of the fish in front of me, I made sure I was appreciating life at its fullest. It might be because I was a cat, or it might be due to my love for meat in my past life, maybe even both. But my love for fish had transcended all realms. My love for fish was only next to my love for kung fu. Marvelous job, Chef Lee. I said and put a spoonful of the fish soup in my mouth. I had different kinds of fish dishes on the table ranging from fried curry and soup. Mr. Lee was the chef of the restaurant and an obese cheetah who looked exactly like Officer Kohlhauser from Zootopia. He nodded at my words with a wry smile. That must have been at least the seventh time I had complimented him, and without regret too. His dish was the best rivaling the likes of Mr. Peng. It was truly a wonder how he was not a popular chef in the city. This world truly did not know how to treat its talents and gems. It had already been two days since my duel with Master Rhino, and his defeat had also been spread amongst everyone in the city. Therefore, I was not even wearing my cloak anymore and showed my face to the world. Other than the gaze filled with fear and the citizens always running away on sight, there was no problem for me showing my face. I was no longer an official criminal after all. But the fact that the restaurant was completely empty when it usually has at least one or two customers any time of the day, would tell you how the people perceive me. Danger. I don't think with my history and strength people were ever not going to see me as a threat. The fact that I won against Master Rhino was also not something that bode well with anyone. It's a clear show that Fire Prodigal was helpless in front of me, and would not be able to stop me if push comes to shove. This caused my past stories to be brought up again too. People were a bad judge. Although I wanted to say how much I didn't care about what the mass and PC thought or said about me, I couldn't. Because to some extent, I cared. If an immediate threat like Shen were to appear suddenly and attack the city, I would go out of my way to protect it. That shows at least a certain level. I cared about the people and the innocents. So no matter how much I tried to deny it, I know some part of me cared about what they said and thought of me. I try to not let them get to my head though. The path you walk shall not lead to glory as you wish. Your quest for validation a failure. History remembers a villain you never wish to be. Destiny is not kind to those who defy her fucking old goat's prophecy. I knew it was never a good idea to indulge in these things. I put a huge chunk of fish in my mouth, and I grumbled in my seat. We'll see who is more stubborn, me or destiny. I knew I would find you here. I heard a voice from behind, and the person quickly took a seat beside me on the counter. Master Gazelle. I said and acknowledged her presence. You don't have to be polite with me, Tai Lung. You can call me Gazelle, it's fine. She said alluringly. There was always a teasing nature in whatever she did, which I have come to learn was because of her kung fu. Although I said I have learned and mastered all forms of kung fu, there were certain skills I could not master due to my size, gender or species. Long Mei Kwong, the kung fu gazelle had mastered was one of them. So it would not be wrong to say that I respected her more than other ordinary masters, due to her kung fu, which even I could not learn. So gazelle, what brings you here? Last time I noticed you were not too fond of fish. I asked while eating my food. Nothing in particular. I just wanted to see you, she said, and I gave her a side eye, and asked if you were going to stay in the city tonight again. If so, I have much better hotels than the one you are staying, she said, and before I could speak, she continued, I know you have no interest in those things, but it's really just a luxurious hotel, and maybe a massage if you desire, how about it? I will even let you stay for free, as long as you give me permission to advertise my hotel by saying Tai Lung once stayed here, she said and let out pleasant giggles. I did not answer her immediately, and instead took the time to slowly eat my food which was nearly finished. I let the silence stretch between us as I analyzed the different layers behind her words. They want me gone soon, huh? I said and looked her in the eye. I saw her freeze up briefly before she relaxed with a sigh. Although it might seem like she just wanted to form connection with me, and truly wants me to stay in her hotel. I knew otherwise. She was a member of the Kung Fu Council. It was just a way of trying to monitor me and her question was also just a way to ask when I was going to leave without making it obvious. Yes, she admitted that people indeed wanted me to leave. The nobles are on edge, and the Kung Fu Council is considering if they should send more members to Gongman City, or if they should remain as they are to not provoke you. They think they can force me to leave. It's for safety. She corrected, the people are afraid Tai Lung, and they need assurance. 
I admit I did not have the best history with my alleged rampage in the Valley of Peace in Milan City, but this kind of fear was not warranted. And the nobles, you are scaring off business with your presence Tylum. If you don't leave soon, I am afraid they would be forced to take action to protect their source of wealth. She said and I couldn't help but growl. She flinched back and reached for the dagger on her back. Her muscles tensed as she prepared to at least fight back if I were to kill her in anger. After a few seconds, I stopped and got up from my seat. You don't have to worry about me. I was planning on leaving today, I said. If they did not welcome me even after I was stripped of my criminal identity, there was nothing I could do about it. It was their city, and I knew better than anyone how my presence had affected the city. Everything changed after my identity was revealed. Even Mr. Lee had lost all his other customer ever since I ate at his restaurant. Here you go, Mr. Lee. Thank you for the meal as always. I said and tossed a huge string of coins to make up for all the customers I scared away. Then without any more words, I put on my cloak and left the restaurant. I did not stop there as I immediately made my way to the gate of the city. I also noticed how much fewer people were in the first district of Gongman City. Traders and travelers had avoided the city due to my presence. It made me feel frustrated that they had such irrational and illogical fear of me. There was a lump on my throat when I saw people quickly making way for me. Was it sadness? I quickly went out of the city, and I did not stop until I was decently far away. After that, I stopped walking and stood still on the road leading to the city. I went into thought as I contemplated my situation. It was not fair, I will admit that, but life was not fair. Destiny is not kind to those who defy her. History remembers a villain. The voice of Soothsayer echoed in my mind. It was Uguay, and the universe will bullshit that the world still perceived me like this. It would take quite a lot of time until the public changed their opinion of me. But I had the Dragon Warrior and the Jade Palace by my side, so that would help in changing their opinion of me, right? I stood there for some time and watched the city and the beautiful Pearl Lake from afar. I could see how the lake got its name as under the morning sun. The water seemed to glitter like precious pearls. Finally, an idea came to mind as I took out the white peacock feather from my pocket. I took a sniff and remembered its scent before putting it away again. Then I held my nose high and searched for the scent in the air. Snow leopards had a great sense of smell and could smell their prey from miles away. But even with my nose, it was hard to pinpoint the smell. The city was close, so there were many scents mixed in the air, and the thick smell of gunpowder did not help. I entered in a piece and used my kite to fuel a miracle. My sense of smell heightened and finally, I could tell where the smell was coming from. I could track it. I smiled when I realized that Shen was close by. People would stop seeing me like a villain after doing some good things and saving the world right. I I saw him leaving Gongman not too long ago. And I have come to tell about you instantly, just like you asked. The messenger said with a bow. Ha! Huh. Lord Shen scoffed in disbelief. He was the one who had been spreading bad rumors about Tai Lung and initiating chaos and fear amongst the citizens. With more than half the nobles and many citizens by his side, it was not a hard thing to achieve. He also stationed his wolves on the road to Gongman City and spread the rumors of Tai Lung the person deemed evil by Yugui himself, so that they would avoid the city. Lord Shen even ordered his soldiers to rob them if they didn't listen. He could always use more money and metal after all. He was doing all of this in hopes that the Kung Fu Council will take action against Tai Lung. It would be best for him if two of his enemies fight each other, right? And even if the Kung Fu Council failed, Lord Shen could act as the city's savior and help in bringing down Tai Lung with his cannons. That would surely make more people want him back on the throne. But who would have guessed that Tai Lung would leave the city so soon? Lord Shen reckoned Tai Lung would at least stay in the city even if it was just for his pride alone. Yet it was not bad news for Shen. If Tai Lung left the city, that means he would be able to carry out his plans like normal. There will no longer be a variable in his plan. You can leave. Lord Shen ordered the messenger and reclined back on his chair. He rested in his chair calmly and went over his plan in his mind again. But his moment of peace was disturbed when a wolf soldier barged into his room with wide eyes full of fear and a ragged breath. Lord Shen, we are being attacked his plan might just have fired back at him. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.